A very good evening to you. Our guests on After Dark this evening are all men, which may say something about the matter we're discussing. We'll be talking about spies and traitors, the shadowy world of intelligence and counterintelligence. In recent weeks, viewers on Channel 4 have been able to follow the fictional events of a TV drama called A Very British Coup. It's the story of how British intelligence tried to bring down a democratically elected Labour government. For some of the people here this evening, it may all be a little too close to reality. Yet this may be their last opportunity to discuss intelligence matters in public because in a few weeks' time, the law lords will rule on whether secret service officers like Peter Wright should operate under a lifelong oath of silence. Are the security services accountable? Are they above the law? What is national security and who defines it? At what point does an open society suddenly close? These questions are particularly important to our guests this evening. Let me introduce you to them. As Secretary of State for Northern Ireland and then Home Secretary, Merlin Rees was closer than almost anybody else at the time to the secret world of intelligence. In 1971, he sat on the committee that examined Section 2 of the Official Secrets Act. More recently, he's been at the forefront of calls for an investigation into Peter Wright's spycatcher allegations. H. Montgomery Hyde joined the British Secret Service at the beginning of the Second World War. A journalist, historian, Ulster Unionist MP, he's also written no fewer than 55 books. His range of acquaintances included Guy Burgess and the late Duke of Windsor. Robert Harbinson is a writer, composer and lecturer on architecture. In the 1970s, his friendship with the traitor Anthony Blunt led him to contact the Sussex police. How that links with questions being asked in Parliament about the Kinkora Boys' Home in Northern Ireland is something he may be able to explain to us. Air Commodore Alistair Mackey took part in the D-Day operation and the Battle of Arnhem. In the early 60s, he was seconded to work as a Cabinet Secretary on the Joint Intelligence Committee. In 1968, he left the military because he disagreed with Britain's nuclear deterrent. He is now Vice President of CND. Robin Ramsey was born in Edinburgh. He's the editor of a magazine called Lobster, described in a recent newspaper article by the Tory MP Ray Whitney as an obscure publication that regularly carries names of alleged members of the security services, providing the opportunity for them to be reproduced in the national media. Such instances, Mr Whitney went on, greatly increased the risks of attacks on security officers by terrorists and others. Jock Kane was a radio operator at GCHQ, the government organisation that intercepts communications all over the world. Later this evening, he may explain to us why he left GCHQ and why he thinks his two books on the intelligence community have both been blocked by the government. And finally, Gary Murray. Gary worked for the security arm of the RAF before leaving to become a private investigator and then a freelance for the security services. Mr Murray is also a journalist who has investigated the death of anti-nuclear campaigner Hilda Murrell. Mr Murray, let me begin, if I may, with you. You have worked as, as we said, as a freelance for right. British security. Yeah. How were you recruited? Why were you recruited? What exactly happened? It was a long, bizarre story, but um, my life as a private investigator for a period of 15 to 18 years, I had a lot of contact with security service officers on a one-to-one -one basis and um, we would exchange information as most private investigators do but eventually in 1979 i was a member of a private um, institute of investigators operating in britain and at the time i joined this organization i had no idea that also serving as members of this institute we had security service officers raf intelligence the army Navy, special branch officers, ministry of defense officers. And this was quite a surprise. Eventually, in 1979, just out of the blue, I received a phone call from someone who mentioned the name of someone I knew in security and asked if we could have a meet. And I rendezvoused a couple of days later at a certain address in Whitehall. Uh, two or three uh, weeks later, there was another meeting, and we had discussions about a specific project Eventually, I was talked, well, not really talked, I offered to work for them on a co contract basis as a civilian. And arrangements were made for, for meetings and how to submit reports. And operational procedures were discussed. And I became a freelance spy. 
not a pleasant experience. Tell us in a moment why it was not a pleasant experience, but tell us first of all what exactly you did for them. That I will never reveal. My name is not Peter Wright. I will only explain generally. Um, I monitored the activities of people who were suspected of subversion, suspected of espionage, or so I was led to believe. It took me about two months to realize that the people I was investigating were not subversives, were not spies, were just ordinary people, perhaps uh, voicing their opinions a little too loudly. Um, this gradually began to irritate me, and um, I began to realize that if I didn't do something to protect myself, I could find myself in uh, media, uh, with a problem with the media, or anything could go wrong. So I started um, impressing upon my operational controllers. I wanted some kind of formal arrangement between us, and I wanted guidelines. Um, believe it or not, this went on for two, over two years. They managed to talk me into continuing with operations without any written instructions, without any guidelines, purely on a one-to-one -one basis with, I think, seven or eight individuals I dealt with. Um, not a lot of people would have uh, acted like this without doing something. I didn't. I started tape recording my conversations with them and collecting their car numbers and keeping a record, a diary, and gradually building up my own dossier. And eventually I went to a solicitor, explained to him what was happening. I said, look, I want some kind of proof that I'm working for these people. So a solicitor became involved. I swore an affidavit. I think this was about a year after I worked, started working for them. And we continued on like this. I was very unhappy but wanted to work for them. It was a client, um, operative relationship. And I think subconsciously, as a private investigator, I wanted to be able to say to myself, I'm working for HMG. I, it would be untruthful to say anything else. But I became emotionally disorientated. Um, I was instructed, mustn't keep copy reports, so I did. Mustn't tell my wife, so I did. In fact, my wife typed the reports, and eventually she became involved in operations with me. Um, I would take her out to meetings, these furtive little meeting places in Guildford and Windsor and funny little places where they meet. And they were not very professional, the individuals I was dealing with. One was a drunk. One used to turn up regularly late for meetings. His watch would be completely unserviceable. And he would pull out 10 by 8 photographs, stick them in front of me and say, Do you know this man? things like that. <laughs> and I, I couldn't believe this was happening. But at the same time, ironically, I was working or had a relationship with um, an MI6 officer. We were very close friends. We served in a unit together. and I became uh, a relative of the family. I won't go into that because he's still serving. And they found out. They knew of this relationship. And five and six do not share the same bed. This is not on. And immediately it was, you must stop seeing this man. He's not doing the operation any good. So I immediately went to this man in six and said, look, and we, we nicknamed them the Wombles, the Wombles of Curzon Street. And it, it got to become a joke. And I remember the, the day I resigned, for the want of a better expression, as though it was yesterday, I was told in no uncertain terms that the powers to be would not be happy with this. And there was an immediate attempt to blackmail me. And this I found quite frightening. I thought, perhaps it's me, perhaps it's my emotional condition. I'm not suited to this work. Well, I wasn't. I know now I wasn't suited to that kind of work. And um, immediately I retaliated and said, I've kept reports. I've got your car numbers. I know the name of your dog. I know where you live. Although they were obviously using totally false surnames. But I, f I found ways to actually identify the people I was working with and their offices. I mean, they'd give me three three phone numbers, all leading into the same building but with different exchanges, totally different areas of London, all leading into Curzon Street, things like that. But the most distressing part of the whole affair with the security service was, will you supply me with bugging equipment from one operational controller? Will you do this? Will you do that? Can you get a hold of this? N no question of, if anything goes wrong, you know, you can ring us and we'll help you out. And I didn't like this at all. I, you know, refused to actually to do anything like that. And the most horrendous request I had was an indirect um, suggestion, I suppose, but coming from, you know, you know, an honest degree in whatever he had from Cambridge, this question, uh, question I'm about to tell you was not professional. Will you take someone for a ride in your aeroplane and drop them out? So I'm, I'm a pilot. 
and I found this. I thought, well, this is auto-suggesting. They're testing me to see if I'll go the whole way. And I'm sure if I said, yes, I'll take so-and-so and drop him out over the North Sea. Surely they weren't being serious, were they? Well, is this a serious professional question for an MI5 officer to put to a freelance agent? If you were working for a security department and this was put to you in a joking way, what would you think? I know what I was thinking. I thought, well, I could make £100,000 here and drop him over the North Sea. No one would you know, know any different. But, of course, I didn't do it. I mean, is this a professional way to operate? Was that figure actually offered to you? I no, no, that's my um, interpretation. I mean, naturally, you don't say, oh, no, I can't do that. You think, well, I'm a secret agent. Mm, you weigh the pros and cons up, but it would be untruthful to say no. Um, how, how much did they pay you, in fact? Oh, um, initially a very small retainer, but this gradually um, increased over the, over the months. Uh, there was a retainer, a monthly retainer, plus expenses, any expenses. I mean, I could virtually claim for anything. When you say a small retainer, Gary, I, I'm just obviously well, pressing I you, I mean... That's not really relevant to the facts in this year. I, mean, I think it is, I think it is. No, no, I don't think Are so. Are we talking tens of pounds, hundreds of pounds, um, thousands well, of pounds? Well, we're not talking tens. I mean, it would cost me that just to drive to Windsor or Guildford for a meeting. No, we're talking over the... It was a part-time operative salary, which I'm not prepared to reveal. I don't think that's really relevant. Let me ask you this. When they, uh, you said they, they try to blackmail you in the end, mm. how was the blackmail to work? It was their immediate reaction. Uh, my resignation took place by phone. They phoned me up one day to arrange a meeting. And I said, well, the next meeting's the last. Um, that's it, finished. I said, I've had enough. Oh, I don't think my boss is going to like that. We'd better talk this over. I said, no, no more talking. This has happened. Time and time again, someone from the uh, head of section comes down and whines and dines me, gives me the lecture about Queen and Country, the usual business. I said, it's over. We might not like that. That might not be in your interests to do that. So that's when I immediately thought, warning bells, do 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 do. You read about these things in the paper and you watch television programs, you know, and you think, God, what am I doing? This is terrible. And so I immediately explained that I'd kept reports and a diary and tapes. Stunned silence, absolute horror. Shock horror, we've been caught. And we had a, a further meeting at the, as it was then, the Cunard Hotel in Hammersmith. I think it's possibly still the Cunard, I don't know. I was given a brown paper envelope with some money in. And they, uh, well, we, I think we were together for about an hour uh, during that time. There was no attempt to change my mind. Um, I had the feeling that perhaps someone else was monitoring me monitoring the whole operation, and I was being photographed and filmed for future reference. It was just an hour, 60 minutes of nothing, really. Um, and that was it. I haven't heard or seen of the security service except from my friend in MI6 until this day. John Kane, um, your experience, um, in a sense, is right at the other end of the spectrum from Gary Murray's experience. Gary was a, a freelance operator who touched with the the, the secret intelligence community for a relatively short number of months. By contrast, you worked for GCHQ for, I think, 32 years. Um, what's your reaction to, to Gary Murray's story? Well, I believe his story. It's uh, quite, quite credible in the understanding I have of the workings of the services. Um, the thing which comes out there, which I have experienced, is that um, people do things for more for personal reasons than for national reasons. The experience I have is that um, loyalty to Queen and Country now takes a back seat to embarrassment. Embarrassment to departmental embarrassment, political embarrassment, have a much higher priority than national security. And the people he's talking about now uh, were aiming at something which quite probably had nothing to do with national security at all, mm. was um, either for their, inter their own interests or the interests of their department, but nothing to do with national security. 
And I've also experienced what he said about the rivalry between the um, different departments, the intelligence departments. Now, you can get a healthy rivalry, which can be good, but this jealousy that exists between MI5, MI6, GCHQ is most harmful to the country. You find that people are not prepared to allow others to assist when national security is threatened. Uh, we have this situation that um, when someone wishes to um, cover up uh, a departmental error or something which is embarrassing politically, uh, they can call in certain people in these services. And these people will go to any lens, even though they are aware that the cover-up is against the interests of national security. So I can quite understand what's happened here, and I'm quite sure that, although he couldn't reveal uh, what it was all about, that it was something to do with uh, covering up someone's errors or someone's false behaviour. What Gary was saying about, um, if you like, the, the incompetence of his controllers, I mean, one of them being a drunk, one having a watch that didn't work and so on, your personal experience of, of senior people in this area, does that ring true? Oh, very true. Um, I mean, I have my own experiences of drunks, alcoholics, um, corrupt people in these organisations, and senior officials and senior politicians didn't want to know. Uh, I come back again to the embarrassment situation. I find that... T tell us the specific example that, that you're referring to there, you, where, where politicians didn't want to know. Well, uh, I... conducted a campaign for many years trying to alert all authorities up to the, the highest level and up to prime minister level about the um, dangers to national security in GCHQ, about um, lethargic and negligent security, about people involved in corruption, and um, which was the one thing we were drummed into is if you're involved in corrupt, corruption and get indulged in corrupt practices, you're vulnerable to blackmail. And yet, when I brought these things forward, no one wanted to know. But the thing which disturbed me most of all um, was my experiences with politicians. Um, I went through every level of the department, and foreign office and home office, and so on and so forth, with these allegations, and eventually reached, um, as I said, uh, Prime Minister level. And in doing so, I have been with both administrations, Labour and Conservative. And my experience was that whilst Labour was in office, Conservative parliamentarians were most anxious to get involved in my allegations as a means of embarrassing the Labour administration. When the Conservatives came into office, they backed off. And I found then that Labour politicians were very interested to get involved in my allegations to embarrass the Conservative administration. And I think this is shocking. Uh, I think that national security has been harmed by politicians who are more interested in embarrassing the uh, incumbent government than they are in protecting the, the nation's secrets. I think a little later we'll come on and discuss what exactly this phrase national security really means and, and whether it's sort of national security or party, politi uh, party political uh, dogma that's, that's taking place here. But uh, uh, returning to, to your experience again for a moment, you've now written two books yes. about your experiences. They've, uh, they've both been blocked by the government. Yes. What is your analysis or interpretation of that? Well, those books were written after I had been, as I said before, up to two prime ministers. I had taken every possible step to try to draw attention to uh, what was happening. And as I said, they were blocked by chicanery, by quite downright lies. 
and um, I went to the media. One Action did a program on my allegations. Uh, the Prime Minister asked questions about it in the House of uh, Commons, um, made a general statement that uh, my allegations were largely without foundation, but where they were well founded, requisite improvements had taken place. Uh, but uh, that was in 1980, and I think the Jeffrey Prime affair and later, latterly the Cyprus affair made it quite clear that requisite improvements had not taken place. Mm -hmm. And I felt that my duty to put and print what I'd been doing in an effort to bring to atten the attention of uh, not only the public but also politicians what was happening, because I hear politicians continually on radio, television, and in the press, writing in the press, that they are concerned about national security. But there was definitely no concern about the allegations I was making uh, on this. So I wrote the book, which I called GCHQ, The Negative Asset, and Robert Hale intended to publish it in May 1984. And in March 1984, the government took out an injunction on the grounds that it could be harmful to national security. So in that case, that I expected to be prosecuted, but there was no prosecution come. Special branch came to my house, five special branch officers arrived at my house on a Sunday morning in a small uh, Hampshire town where there's no chance of getting a solicitor with knowledge of the Official Secrets Act on a Sunday morning. So, I mean, it was quite obviously intimidatory. Um, and eventually I, spent two days answering questions to a special branch. Not one question about my allegations. I was never asked about my allegations, only about how I'd gone about <coughs> publishing so on and so forth. So special branch weren't allowed to ask about my allegations. Um, so I sat back and waited and waited and no injunction. So I decided to write another book, which I did. And this one was called The Hidden Depths of Treachery. And um, the intention then was to, uh, the, the publisher was going to submit this book when it was, had been edited to um, the Treasury solicitor. But um, somewhere the government got wise to it in advance, and before we got the opportunity, they slapped an injunction on that book too. But there's still been no attempt to prosecute me uh, for this supposedly uh, harm to, or possible harm to national security. Merlin Rees, can I, can I ask you what do you feel uh, specifically about um, Jock Haynes' experience in terms of his inability to get his allegations published in, in book form? I mean, clearly he has managed to uh, express his views in, in other media, but specifically the, the way in which the Treasury solicitors do actually go for injunctions against books in this kind of way. What's your, what's your view on that? Well, <clears throat> it may well be that under a reformed Official Secrets Act of the best sort, let alone one that one might disagree with, that you were revealing information that you shouldn't have revealed. I don't know. I know nothing about it. Never come my way. How can I make a judgment about it? And I simply tell you, because so that I establish my views about it, I think the state, and that's something we ought to talk about, uh, has the right to protect its secrets. My disagreement has been that it's protecting the wrong secrets, but that's another matter too. And therefore GCHQ, which I knew nothing about until all the stuff has been written in the newspapers in recent years, I never knew anything about it, and what goes on there and what is involved there, and I know nothing about politicians and at some level or other who enjoy embarrassing uh, a government. All I would say is this, that if, and I take it at face value, uh, as I, all I can do, that the allegations you make certainly ought to be investigated and there ought to be a means of them being I investigated. Similarly, when uh, you talk uh, in the way that you did, and again, mm something I know nothing about, and perhaps because I brought with me the directive under which I operated as Home Secretary. And all of you will know it. It's the Maxwell Fife Directive, which is now nearly 40 years old. And it says, you and your staff to the director, and this is Fife, will maintain the well-established convention 
whereby ministers do not concern themselves with the detailed information which may be obtained by the security services in particular cases, but are furnished with such information only as may be necessary for the determination on any issue on which guidance is sought. That's the way it operates. Again, rightly or wrongly, but correctly in the sense of this is what Parliament uh, agreed in 1952. And therefore, what concerns me about both those who've spoken so far, in a field I know nothing about, that, uh, and I really genuinely can't recall the Prime Minister asking uh, answer. Jobs when you want them, your freedom when you don't. We're now in the approach phase, everything looking good. Go for orbit, go for orbit. Oh man, that's incredible. The eagle has landed. Budweiser, this is what a beer's all about. Clerical Medical's performance pensions are so flexible, they'll have a plan to suit you. So you get the return you need. Ask your financial advisor. <laughs> Lamara, the only language your body needs. Of the people that came to you. Those are things that ought to be investigated and investigated openly because they bring the security services 6, GCHQ, 5 into disrepute. But, but frankly, I'd, I'd never come across what you're talking about because it wasn't my scene. Well, this rather surprises me because in April 1977, you were Home Secretary, mm -hmm. and I set out a letter with a number of appendices, which I sent via an MP to you as Home Secretary with a copy to... Who did to you send it by? An MP. And the only <laughs> way I'll it. identify it is if you yes. just... But anyway, I did with a copy to the, um, the d director of GCHQ. So, I mean, I wasn't going b sure. behind his back. I, was yeah. I gave him a copy. I sent yeah. a copy of the letter, and I have the receipt for that yeah. copy there. So I was under the impression that you had received my uh, uh, allegations. Well, I mean, all I tell you is if it came to my office about GCHQ and 6, it'll have gone over to the Foreign Office straight away, quite properly, because it doesn't work to me. I know nothing about it. But, uh, but uh, the, the, it's the Foreign Secretary who was concerned with your side of things. But when I say I know nothing about it, it's, it's a fact, I'm not washing my hands of it. it Oh, I've been to the Foreign Secretary. David Owen was Foreign Secretary. Well, there you are. But uh, I, again, I'm saying it's not the Home Office. Mm. But it doesn't matter very much to our argument at no, the moment. No, no. There, there, you make serious allegations that ought to be investigated uh, properly. But I come back <coughs> to the general point that I have as a politician is, is the words are, which may be judged subversive of the state. That is the aspect that I query, and I hope we're going to get round to, because there, from my point of view, is because there are some aspects, simply the dirty tricks against the Wilson government, which under no uh, definition can be regarded as the safety of the state or anything of that kind. Uh, it, it, is just, uh, it is just wrong and should not be sheltered, in my view, under the Official Secrets Act, let alone anything else. Bernie Rees, let me say, I, I mean, that you, both of those important points that you raised there are matters which we're going to come back yeah. to. We've obviously got a, a lot of time in which to do that. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me take us on a little, if I may, and let me move on to, to Alistair Mackey. Um, I, I, I understand that you were seconded for a while as a, a Cabinet Secretary to the Joint Intelligence Committee. Is that correct, first of all? Yes, I worked for the Joint Intelligence Committee, but I don't have any shock horrors to tell you about that, and if I did, 
I wouldn't. You wouldn't tell us anyway. I see the thing from a perspective of somebody working as I now do in the peace movement, and I think in contrast to my colleagues in this discussion this evening, I have the unique distinction of not being either your actual spook <laughs> or having written a book about it. So I do feel that if I can bring anything to it, it is perhaps a slight degree of detachment. Well, and I think that's interesting me, and, and important. Me, the stories that we've heard in the last few minutes uh, prompt me to suggest that Merlin Rees's suggestion that the rules need examining is the most useless one because, quite plainly, the rules are never obeyed. And his suggestion that the thing ought to be investigated is equally useless because all investigations would finish up in the same kind of morass uh, which the secret departments do seem plainly very capable of creating. And I do feel utterly thankful for a few goodies in the setup. And I have in mind, of course, people like Kathy Masseter, who, bless her heart, uh, exposed the dirty tricks being done by the secret departments breaking their own rules in keeping tabs on CND people who were doing the perfectly legitimate thing of campaigning against nuclear weapons. And I'm sad that if this frightful white paper is ever implemented, and perhaps I should say in parenthesis that it's not surprising that the white paper is as it is. It is not surprising that the government is simply doing it because they are scared stiff of Peter Wright and his like. It does seem to me that they have some justification because it's perfectly obvious to me from this outside standpoint that the secret departments are full of rascals of various kinds and that the bag of worms, even if you stir it, will simply come back to its original nauseating format. I'd like to say one thing, because I have an interest in clearing this up. Uh, in the years from 74 to 79, it would be wrong of you to suggest that all of them in five, which is what I knew, are rascals. Oh, I'm prepared to concede that uh, I mean, there I will be most one or two non-rascals. Well, there may, be, there may be far more than that. statistical probability. No, no, I think you spoil uh, something that I'm concerned about by the umbrella uh, mm. approach. I it. agree. I think it's most important. I, 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 I have no interest in denigrating a group of people. I can only speak from experience. That there are some who it seems have done, uh, broken the rules or whatever, that is what would be investigated. I think if we approach it from your point of view, we'll get nowhere. Because it's like saying that all RAF, ex-RAF officers, which is you and I, come under a certain category, or all school teachers, or all university teachers, or all television commentators doesn't help it is it is not true from my experience that that's the case that there obviously are things to look at is a different way of looking at it a they're not apple. all rascals a bad it's apple a... in a good barrel you think yes well i don't know what are these rules they've broken where are the rules well this this is this is my this is my point mm. a paragraph what well, exactly there so are there are no rules. Well, you can't say they're out of control because there is no control. Well, there no, never no. was any control. Well, and I, here again, you see, I'm trying... They've been running a mock from 1945. Well, I don't believe they've been run, running a mock. The I believe that you. once that comes up a, against the establishment or whatever, we are lost. I think we've got to pick the points that we are concerned about. And when we isolate those, they are the ones that I would want to investigate. But I believe the umbrella approach gets us nowhere, it'll just be in the Sunday newspapers, a few questions in Parliament, and it is lost. We need to know, we need to be sure about the allegations and not the umbrella allegations which brings in everybody. You're not I saying that... I don't think much no. of your umbrella, your umbrella metaphor. It seems to me that what we ought to look for yes. is a few little pinpoints of light... But you didn't say the that. ...the infinite gloom. Because I hadn't thought of it, I'm inspired by what you've just I said. Okay. <laughs> a few little pinpoints of light in the encircling gloom and see if we can do something about them. But, but, but you're, the not, you're is, not arguing that everybody no, but, in GCHQ was a rascal. No, but what I am arguing about, and I argue against you on this, is that the good guys you were talking about knew what was going uh, on and did nothing uh, about it. That's, again, important. But what I, I want to establish is that we're not denigrating everybody with a broad brush, but you or must I believe do. that's a mistake. Why not? Because the you good guys do. don't if, do anything. If they won't do anything about it, they are in there, they are, they are in there to protect the national secrets. Mm. And they know that national secrets are endangered because of the bad guys, mm. put up for another term. So therefore, it was their duty 
to stand up and speak out. So they're all heard. bad guys? Well, they are, by inference, they must be, because they were not prepared to carry out their duty. You see, what we have in, in this country is this business that, uh, oh, it's not done to tell tales. Well, if you are in the intelligence service, you are working in the national interest, you're working for the country, and therefore, if someone is doing something wrong, mm. then you should tell tales. We've had ambassadors sleeping with maids and embassies who have turned out to be KGB agents. We, we've, we've had uh, top-ranking diplomats who have been pedophiles, and we've had all sorts of people involved in things. Uh, people knew about it. We, we had an, uh, uh, a top civil, service in, uh, civil servant in Tel Aviv quite recently, and the entire embassy knew that she was having an affair with uh, an Egyptian spy, and no one said a word about it. It took the Israeli intelligence service to pinpoint it before anything was done about it. And this is what I say is wrong. These people knew that, there was a, that, that national security was being endangered and did nothing about it. And this is why I say there are no good guys if they're not prepared to put their name on the line and say, look, I'm not prepared to accept this situation. I wonder, could I take a point up with Marilyn Reese? He's the only person here tonight who's taken the oath of the Privy Council. Oh, yes. mm. Now, is it an old boy club? I mean, in terms of the Privy Council, the fact that I took the oath matters to me, but it's not an old boys club by, by any means. As far as I, I'm concerned, if there are things against the interest, uh, not of the government, which doesn't interest me very much, of any government, but uh, of the country, and there's all sorts of definitions about that. How I do something about it matters to me. The approach I've taken is, is the sort of journalistic approach, which over the years I've grown to despise and despair of, that when there is something to do, something to chase, it is ruined by making general allegations instead of the particular allegations. And there's a difference between what you've uh, alleged and what you've alleged you, your allegations are against uh, those in Tel Aviv or wherever who should have reported what was going on because and elsewhere. And elsewhere. Aviv, but yes. do you have an allegiance over and above Parliament by having taken this oath to the Queen? My allegiance is quite clear to me um, that my allegiance is not to my party, which I belong to for 50 years, not to Parliament. If there are things that are wrongly done in any walk of life, then it is my job as a member of parliament to do something about it. That's the point. But you don't belong to a superior club, an establishment club. I don't, no, most no. certainly. Therefore, would it be right for me to think that somebody in your club, at the Privy Council, who thought it was in the interests of the country to take matters out of the High Court because it might embarrass the Queen. Now, I ask this for one reason. I, as a friend of Anthony Blunt, mm. he's dead. I had a dispute with Anthony Blunt, which came before the Queen's bench. Anthony Blunt is dead, but the two senior statesmen your fellow colleagues in the Privy Council are alive today. One in particular, particularly close advisor to Mrs. Thatcher, he wanted it taken out of the High Court. Why? Because it would have embarrassed, amongst others, Lord Manbatten. I have known the Privy Council and its workings for a very long time, from somebody like B.B., Brendan Brecken, the Minister of Information in the War. Now, I'm very often quoted in things like Private Eye as anti-establishment. My row has not been for Labour or the Conservative Party, but for free speech. I don't think anybody should be able to step into the breach and say to me, oh, dear Robin, you must not uh, proceed with this and have Anthony Blunt going into the witness box in the High Court simply because it's going to embarrass 
uh, his cousin, the Queen Mother, because these people belong to the Privy Council, as you do. Now, I believe that the Privy Council and its privileges, as I've known them over the years, and dealt with these people, including, I might say, Churchill's, and you must remember it was not me who brought Churchill's into the High Court, but Lord Hailsham, the former Lord Chancellor, in my row. There is this old boys club. I don't agree with old boys clubs. Parliament should be the supreme court. <clears throat> but it isn't in my experience. Was it an old boys club in a sense in, uh, I'm thinking, the period before the Second World War and then running into the Second World War that led to the infiltration of British security by people like Anthony Blunt, Burgess, McLean, Philby. But was that an old boys club? Of course it was. Let us go back to personal vendettas. There's a personal vendetta between Anthony Blunt and myself. When Anthony Blunt was in the left, he was my friend. When he became more Tory than Mrs. Thatcher, we became enemies. Now, what was another greater vendetta of the Cambridge School? Surely that of the person, Blunt's great friend, Prince Doria. Who's Prince Doria? Well, there you are. Well, no, don't say that. Explain it to us, because we don't know what you're talking Prince about. Prince Doria. Philippa Doria became a socialist at Cambridge. Uh, to the internationally known things, your quickest things to him was, at the end of the Second World War, a man, an American writer, friend, man who made T.S. Eliot, was locked up. Pound. Pound, Ezra Pound. And what did the Allied troops do? Immediately proclaimed Prince Doria mayor of Rome, because he had suffered more than any other human being in the vendetta with Mussolini. Did he not? This is unintelligible. I'm not sure, quite sure where this is actually taking us, Robin. Well, I mean, the question, the question I was asking was, was whether or not there was uh, actually some kind of old boys network. I think you've answered positively that there was. Let me ask Montgomery Hyde what, uh, what your experience was in, in these terms, because obviously you were involved in the security services during the Second World War at about this time. I mean, the kinds of stories that we've heard this evening from, from Gary Murray, from Jock Kane, are they the kind of stories that shock you? Are they the kind of stories that you would have found shocking had they yes, been I happening think, in the Second I World think War? So. I think they have shocked me. Uh, just going back for a moment to what Robin said, um, I knew Prince Doria quite well. You uh, have written of eight generations of his family. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know as many as that, but I knew him quite well. I knew his wife, and I was in the beautiful house where he has one Lots of the of most Doria. famous uh, picture of uh, Pope Innocent X. Oh, um, good old Pope Innocent. Uh, but um, I don't. He had really nothing to do, as far as I know, with uh, secret intelligence. I certainly take, take us on to never discussed then. it with him. But I was in, uh, in, 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 in Rome. Um, why? No, 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 no. Just a minute. I, I, I think what, what I'd like to ask is a very specific question. It, We've heard. It, it, we, it, let, a, let me just ask a question. This old boys uh, club. Well, I um, was recruited by a friend in MI. Six or the Secret Intelligence Service in the autumn of 1938, just after the, the Munich uh, crisis. And um, it took quite a long time for my clearance to come through. Uh, and um, I knew one or two other friends in MI6. And uh, I went to them and I said, why am I not getting a clearance uh, quickly? And they said, well, we uh, try and find out. 
Well, one of Gray Murray's previous investigators or predecessors uh, was investigating me, and he finally came uh, up with a document which gave uh, curriculum vitae particulars of my life, which occupied about a quarter of the sheet. And then underneath there was a heading, anything recorded against. And there was only one thing recorded against me, and that was what held up my clearance for so long. And that was this single sentence. Purchased a single ticket to Leningrad in 1933. The question was, why was it a single ticket? Were you interested in communism? Were you going to be a communist? Why was it a single ticket? Why didn't you take a return ticket? Well, the answer which I gave was that uh, I intended to have a tour of the Soviet Union and to return to this country uh, via uh, Finland and uh, the rest of the Scandinavian countries. Uh, but um, uh, there was a, a, a certain amount of the old boy network in uh, MI6 when uh, I joined and was finally recruited. Did you find that the kinds of stories that uh, Gary Murray was telling us earlier on of, of incompetence, drunkenness, so on and so forth? Yes, I think, I think he, he said that MI6 uh, and MI5 were not in the same bed, but of course he's quite right there because there was a, a great deal of ill feeling between the two services. I always thought that um, MI5 had, had this over MI6. They had much finer premises in St. James's Street, whereas MI6 had ra rather uh, dingy premises in um, Broadway near St. James's Underground Station. I suppose nowadays, Montgomery, the form would have just said, instead of about the Leningrad ticket, it would just have said, not one of us. Uh, yeah, yes. I, could think, we, I, think I, I wonder if we could get back to Merlin Reese's if I may say so, laudable suggestion about actually doing something about this. Mm. And in what I regard as a thoroughly limp and inadequate way, the government is making some attempt to do something about this with this white paper. And of course the white paper is presented in a very bland and friendly and convincing and sickeningly self-righteous way in that it brings the notion of a free, fair trial by jury to those people who transgress by imparting state information which they should not impart. The delicious pantomimic feature of this white paper, however, is that the very people who may fall foul of the courts, people, if I may say so, could have been you and you, are those who do not get a fair trial by jury. Because if this is implemented, a person who is of the security services, formerly of the security services, or on a little list, a Gilbertian little list, certified by the minister, he has no defense. He has simply disclosed something, and that's it. And similarly, there is to be a total prohibition upon what is euphemistically called interception. That being interpreted means phone tapping and bugging. So that the sort of things that have come out in the trials of ex-members of the security services or people who've been connected with them, such as the Clive Ponting trial, will no longer happen. The Pontings, if there's a repetition, will simply be guilty. Bang, bang, he said something. He was on the magic cordoned off crowd of people. We will never again hear enunciated so that it can be ridiculed the monstrous doctrine that the, the policy of the state, the doctrine of the state is the doctrine of the party in power and that blessed jury that threw that rubbish out yeah. against the judge and the attorney general. Yeah. Forgive me, if we're going to do something, we've yeah. got to start playing hell about the awful deception that is being practiced by the minister who put this forward in a bland way as if it was something liberalizing, whereas it is, in, it is in fact something highly restricting. That would be doing something, Merlin, I suggest. Yes, but I think you're confusing the two things that concern me 
in six, it's, sorry, in GCHQ and five, five, those issues need to be investigated. Now you've opened up the whole Pandora's box of this. Now I appeared in court for Clive Bonte, uh, and under this, where secret and above is going to be the criminal charges, it wouldn't have affected Clive Ponting. It would have affected him in another sense. And because I've lived and ate and slept with that since 1971, since I was on the Franks uh, Commission, uh, in terms of secret and above being a criminal charge and the rest of it not, it w it, as far as I understand it, Ponting wouldn't have been affected by that. By all means, let's discuss that and the effect on the press and the effect on uh, how issues can be discussed. But I was discussing something quite different. Uh, let me speak about a field that I am interested in. And again, I make the point, not an under an umbrella heading, the allegation that is being made, because I must mm. put it in that way, yes, yes. the allegation that you're making is that people uh, were asking you to do something that was not only out with the law, mm. but out with whatever one makes of the Maxwell Fife uh, Directive. Now, that is very important and something one can concentrate on. But that doesn't come under the heading of the uh, Official Secrets Act, although, come to think of it, um, under the, uh, the present act, you've broken the Official Secrets Act Absolutely. tonight. I signed the Official Secrets Act. But you've broken yes, it tonight. Right. Whether you'd have broken the new one is another matter. That's right, yeah. But the issues, in, to my mind, and there are other issues that, uh, that you're involved in, I strongly believe that particular issues need to be investigated. The, the, the nature of the Official Secrets Act, one of the problems is, said he, is that uh, in terms of the Official Secrets Act and the changes that come to it, is very few people read the Franks report. Uh, everybody uses their emotion against it, either clamp down on everything or free everything. But you did a great service, of course, because what they did, what they've done here, is to use the Franks report as the devil. My hat, if we'd followed the Franks report, the secret would have been simply by ministerial dictat. Ex exactly. But now we've got ministerial dictat in a different form. If it wasn't an insult to a sparrow, I would call it a sparrow painted yellow to make it into well, a Well, I was on Franks. It, it <laughs> may well be the jury. The jury is better than... than I mean, it's a long time ago. That the jury aspect is better than the ministerial dictat. As long as you're not on the minister's list. Well... I'm, I'm not sure you're right on that. It says it in black and well, white. Well, you know, I think it's deeper than that. I think that what, what we should be talking, at least what I want, what I'm concerned about... Specific allegations specific against allegations. the security yes, service. Yes, but I think this Marin is a separate... Reese, what about the gagging writ? Now, the easiest thing to get stop people talking is the gagging writ. It, it, it can't stop you for long, can it? It did. I had gagging writs for 20 years. I see. Well, well I shouldn't the, this, this, yeah. and yeah. Gary Murray's things are not separate because yeah. uh, it doesn't take much to work out what this is meant to do. Is to keep the lid on Gary mm -hmm. Murray's stuff, Jock Kane's stuff, Peter Wright, everyone. Colin Wallace, Fred Holroyd, yeah. Kinkora, you know, yeah. Stalker, the whole great kaleidoscope. Yes, well. I, I must make clear, I have a different view on Stalker. But this that's a this is the cover-up being nailed down in place. This yes, is going to try and keep it all nailed down. Issue. It's not going to succeed. No, but that doesn't affect the Stalker You don't issue. think so? No. I say that for... You think the Stalker issue will eventually be aired, will you? Properly. I hope it does, because the, the full story yeah. isn't out here. You think we'll eventually have a full account from, from the British state about how the state but employed the assassins in Northern will Ireland? never come out. Of course it won't. Pardon? The whole story will never come out. Why not? When the Sussex police interviewed me for roughly seven years... This is under Mr Terry? No. no. Uh, yes, George Terry, before he became Sir George. Between let's, 19... Let's just be clear about this. You're, you're talking about when the Sussex police interviewed you over allegations concerning the Kinkora. No, Kinkora, you see, people are confused. As you will, Bell and Reese, realise, the boys in question could never have been in Kinkora because Kinkora only had people at a certain age, and these people were underneath that age. There were other homes involved, not Kinkora. Well, the main question is, where am I five operating any of these homes for the purpose um, of allowing The only person acts to take I place? knew personally in the services was Oldfield, and he went there. My letters... You're saying Sir Morris Oldfield attended... Yeah, that's right. The only person I had, 
His biographer wrote to me a number of times to, to interview me about it. I said I couldn't because my letters about Oldfield to Captain Peter Montgomery in Northern Ireland could not be revealed because they were before the High Court. How do we know Oldfield attended one of these homes, the Kinkora home or any other I home? don't say he did. Ah, we thought you did. Would you, you just yeah. said Oldfield I went there. I simply... No, no. He went to Northern no, Ireland. Not to one of the homes. And he was involved with a group. Sorry. He had been interviewed in... Uh, Anthony Blunt had been interviewed in Oldfield's flat when Oldfield was in the United States. Mm -hmm. I was, had seen uh, Anthony Blunt the day before he, was, he made his confession. Um, I was very much involved with Anthony Blunt at this time because, as you know, his closest friend in the Secret Service was, in fact, not a man, but a whole family of uh, people uh, who got this, uh, was supposed to be the greatest deception of the war, uh, uh, deceiving the Germans, which I was involved with, and whose family, um, uh, Thomas Harris, Thomas Harris, of course, is today dead. His sisters are still alive. His sister, of course, was the most famous of the J3, Enriqueta, uh, the spies. She's still alive, one of my closest friends. So I knew all this group from the war, from the Minister of uh, Information down. Uh, I am only concerned that the uh, security services can use the law courts for gagging wits. Yeah, I, th I think that's actually a separate matter. I mean, before we move on to that, perhaps, Mr. Ramsey, could just outline for us as carefully, obviously, as you can, what what what, we're, what actually Mr. Hubbins is referring to here. What is what is the threat? Well, I mean, it's, it's obviously a, it's, uh, I'm talking about the Kinkora uh, alleged scandal. Uh, Kinkora. Um, <laughs> Well, roughly speaking, Kincora was a boys' home under the control of Belfast City Council, I think, which was run by uh, a group of the staff became, uh, the staff became, sorry, let me try again, the home became run by a group of Northern Irish militant Protestants who were also homosexuals. The home, this was discovered and MI5 stroke British Army Intelligence uh, had an agent in Kincora because the fact that there were senior uh, radical orange men buggering kids and taking photographs and the photographs have been seen it was obviously a wonderful a gold mine an intelligence gold mine because in 1973-74 when the British state was wrestling with the IRA on one hand and the UDA and the UVF and all the rest of it on the other this kind of dirt was just wonderful stuff and they just could, and they had a guy in there who made weekly reports and so on and so on, and so on. now Kinkora's story is incredibly complicated but essentially it became a faction fight inside in British intelligence in Northern Ireland. One group, I think Army Intelligence, was basically disgusted by it, wanted to leak it. And the other group, basically MI5, said, no, 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 but this is too good, this is too good to miss. That's what the story is. Now, as I understand it, the bit where it impinges on Mr. Harbinson's story is that Mr. Harbinson has written of in various letters that have been injuncted, but which are floating around of an Anglo-Irish upper-class homosexual network. And at the, far front, at the far edge of this network, somebody was bringing, procuring boys for this homosexual network. Now, as he said, it's not Kinkora because the boys are too old. Kinkora was 16 plus, I think. But some of the other homes had younger people. And so I assume people with paedophilic inclinations made use of the, uh, the other homes. I don't know which one he's referring to. What was Anthony Blunt's involvement? He was just part of, just part of this social group. As far as I know, I mean, this, this man is the expert. Hardly yeah. ask me about so Anthony Blunt. Have I done you justice, sir? Yes. Anthony Blunt and Northern Ireland started in 1921 when his father became rector of St. John the Apostle. Excuse me. We want to invest in Far Eastern electronics. Can you tell us where to go? Oh. Via Horvath. Via Hoban. I heard of them. Wake up! Which way for aerospace? It's a good area for investment, you see. Aerospace? 
Straight to Auburn. Yeah, hello. Um, I'm looking for a good way into Australian mining. Via, via, Bahoban! If you've a lump sum and you want to invest in the best of the world markets, via unit trusts, via life assurance or via pensions, the surer way to the city is via Hoban. Prudential Hoban. These remarkable new stamps from the Royal Mail picture the dramatic fate of the Armada 400 years ago. They're at your post office from July the 19th. Main post offices have this handsome presentation pack with a free ticket to the Armada exhibition at the National Maritime Museum and postcards to send or collect. British stamps, beautiful gifts you want to keep. Germanine II is a light, easily absorbed cream that contains an effective antiseptic. It also contains a mild local anaesthetic that gently soothes the pain away. Better now? Germaline too. There's no better first aid cream. Two hours from London is STC Telecommunications, producers of Viscount Telephones, five million already on call in the United Kingdom. That's industrial success. Fifteen minutes from one of Europe's best deep water port facilities is GEC. This power station component for China will weigh 310 tons. Hardly a Chinese takeaway. That's industrial success. 30 minutes from an international airport with excellent freight and passenger facilities is the AVX Corporation, producer of the multi-layer capacitor helping drive BMW cars all over the world. That's industrial success. All three companies are in Northern Ireland. The people to meet are the Industrial Development Board, who have the knowledge and experience that spell success. And they're right on your doorstep. IDB Northern Ireland, we're working for your business. sends the same people in Northern Ireland who wanted to see Wilson out. Those cabinet ministers who wanted to see Wilson out came to see me. Name them. I will not name them. They will come out. Their letters are... In a year's time, we won't even have this programme. Name them now. It's probably your last chance on television. No. Huh? You could be famous in the morning. I am not interested in that sort of thing. They are still alive today. Mm. These are people well, in Northern Ireland? No, there are people that you know. There are people who literally kicked Wilson out of office. What did they do to kick him they, out of office? They kicked Wilson out of office and they got themselves into high places. This is why Mrs. Thatcher consults them today. How did they go about that? How? Ah, because they were blackmailed. Over what? Sex. I think we ought to come back to a slightly more general yes, and comprehensible I think so. point. Uh, I find myself again this evening slightly stupefied by this because we know what Peter Wright said about the attempt to discredit the Labour government by controlled leaks, by extraordinary stories through the appalling Cecil King and his mirror through the general dirty tricks, and that must arouse in us the suspicion right. that the Conservative government has an interest in keeping the security services well muffled so that they can go on with a potential capacity to rubbish 
any opposition which would fit in with the authoritarianism that, that uh, uh, at last plagues us today. The other point, it seems to me, is that what pales into insignificance is Antony Blunt and Philby selling secrets to the Russians. That seems to me to matter a good deal less than Antony Blunt and Philby and many others controlling the flow of information to the policymakers, to the government, and thereby influencing government policy. It seems to me that that's a risk that we ought to be looking at, less matters of people selling secrets or disclosing secrets or betraying things to the Russians, more trying to uh, uh, manipulate government policy by carefully feeding the right information, true or manufactured, to policymakers and ministers. Exactly it seems to me, right. It seems to me we come back to Merlin once again and practical action. That's a piece of practical action that, if I may say so, I think as a rank outsider, ought to be looked at. Merlin Rees, can I ask you to... Do, uh, one sometimes gets the impression from the things that you have said in the past and indeed what you've said this evening, that sometimes you felt that in terms of, perhaps in terms of Northern Ireland, perhaps in terms of your role as the Home Secretary, that uh, you were not given a vast amount of information from, the inter from intelligence sources. Is, is, is that true? I was given all I required in Northern Ireland, which is a separate issue. Um, in terms of my, my job, um, I simply read again uh, what are the rules. Mm. You, will main, you, you and your staff, says the rules, mm. will maintain the well-established convention whereby ministers do not concern themselves with detailed information. The, the and mushroom treatment. Keep speaking in your dark and feed your shit. That, now, the point, the point at issue that I am concerned about is that, and it's the one thing that I have chased in the House of Commons unsuccessfully, is the dirty tricks. I do not believe that that is in any sense the interest of the state under any definition that we're talking about or the country or anything else. And um, uh, there is no doubt in my mind that things went on, not just during the life of the Labour government, but before. Uh, before 74. Well, quite, quite right. Quite right. No, no. Uh, by, by, all I'm saying is denigration of members of the Labour Party, uh, who might well be ministers one day, went on before 74, before the government was formed. Sure. And uh, there's no doubt about that. Now, that was not investigated properly, in my view. Mrs. That Thatcher is says it has been, of course. Pardon? Mrs. Thatcher says it has been but investigated. It hasn't. I mean, she wouldn't know, because I'm not playing political games. No prime minister knows what went on in the previous administration. So she's telling somebody else's lie? No, no. I mean, I, I don't, there's been no investigation, I, I, I don't believe that there's any help in doing it that way. What she says is that it was looked at uh, in the days of Lord Callaghan and myself as prime minister and, and, and home secretary. I don't accept that. And then she asked for it to be looked at again in her day. That is the point that I'm talking about, and it's why I was asking for an inquiry into that aspect of things. And we didn't get that. I thought on the day the Prime Minister was coming to the House, the impression I had, I obviously was very wrong, was that there was going to be an inquiry, but there wasn't. Now, that doesn't come, in my view, doesn't well, come under any definition of the official Don't slide system. past this. She said there was an inquiry, and Sir Anthony Duff conducted an That's inquiry. That's what she says, yes. Now, when the journalists the next day, the higher media, went back to all their sources, Peter Wright and all the people Peter Wright named, and Colin Wallace and all That's other right. people who made the allegations, nobody had been spoken to. That's right. There had been an invisible inquiry. Yes, but whatever. You agree? But, but, yes, I, I don't know about the facts that you're talking about. All I am saying is under any... Uh, official Secrets Act, there is no way that it would stop me, I don't mean me as an individual, as a parliamentarian, carrying on question that, questioning that. There's no way that that could, uh, could, well, could stop you. What would you do tomorrow about Jock Kane's allegations Jock Kane and Gary if you were in well, a position tomorrow? The, uh, I leave that one out of the way because I feel... Or any uh, allegation. The allegation that you make now, Jock Kane's allegations that were made just now were about what King Cora was? Okay. Oh, no. Sorry, I, I beg your pardon. And, and, but I thought you meant your, your allegations. You no, mean so John? It, it, Robin Rams, I was asked to, to explain the allegations. Yeah, I was just laying the, the, the Sorry. background. Yes. How would you deal with an allegation tomorrow if you were in a well, position let's, to do Let's so? take them in order. There's yours about, uh, about uh, GCHQ <clears> that you've been involved in. There's yours about the actions of 
uh, members of MI5 in taking you on as a, a contract officer. Nothing wrong with that in principle. No, I'm not complaining no, about that. But what they're they do. Then there's the question about King Cora, which seems to go back a long, long way, which I, I know nothing about. So I, I, I'd rather take these two. If I were Foreign Secretary or if I were Prime Minister, those allegations that you have made at, I don't know how old they are, for example, how long ago or wherever, but they are things that need to be looked at very firmly by the Security Commission, by a special inquiry or whatever. They're very serious. They're very serious uh, allegations. And yours are very serious uh, uh, allegations. These are the two that concern me tonight. And if they came on my plate, I would find a way in discussion with the Prime Minister of the day in getting them investigated in the pos best possible well, these way. These are just two no, allegations. Not, We've got numerous other what, allegations what of actual think, murders. What do you think the, the motivation then for the government not having uh, an investigation into the allegations specifically about uh, the, the destabilization that allegedly went on as far as Harold Wilson's government was concerned. What do you think the motivation is? Well, the, the, the Prime Mrs. Thatcher has stated in the House of Commons that there were two inquiries, one under in her day by uh, Lord Call James Callaghan. And the, the one in my day with James Callaghan. On the first part, she's misconceived. And she is the Prime Minister, and she has said, no, I shall not stop ever querying that. But in the curious country we live in, no one seems to be. It, it is not continued on. To some degree, I come back to my point earlier, the case is ruined by blanket allegations uh, and stuff in the press, headlines that... That, that prevent the particular points being taken. Well, just have well, a second. Failure because to apply the nostrum, never believe anything until it's been officially denied. <laughs> <laughs> Claude let, Coburn. Let me stick with something you said because it is being carried on. There is, in fact, an MP, a Labour MP, who has done precisely what you said, which is to hammer away at a number of very specific points in that. He's got Ken Livingston. Now, Merlin shakes his head, but Ken is doing it. Ken has asked 100, 150 questions hmm. in the last year. Mm. I've got and a, he's um, asked questions about myself, indeed. and after making the questions of the House of Commons, he's spoken to the press. I don't think, did Ken speak to the press? Are you stuck? You sure? Uh, yes, uh, Liam Clark. He spoke to Liam Clark, and Liam Clark... Did he not do so? Uh, Liam Clark has researched the Sunday Times. He uh, made his... Uh, named the people, the Sussex police who interviewed me, mm -hmm. in the Irish News. Mm -hmm. So? So what? So what? Isn't that a journalist's job? It is a journalist's job. It's a journalist's job to find out why Parliament has got secret old boy societies. Well, I mean, the, the Privy Council is an interesting sidetrack, but a sidetrack nonetheless. Yes, it is. I mean, it's an interesting sidetrack because in 1974, the Privy Council bureaucracy, which is to say that building mm. in, down the road there, was actually subscribing to the publications of Geoffrey Stuart Smith. And he was putting out. He was he was putting out all this at this anti-left, anti-labor. The Privy Council was. The Privy Council was. Ken Living. Uh, he told me that. The Privy Council. Privy Council subscribed to Geoffrey Stuart Smith's publications, and Geoffrey Stuart Smith told me this. It doesn't year. exist. The Privy Council. Ken Livingston asked a question this year. Would would the Privy Council please list all the magazines it subscribes to? And it's currently subscribing to about sixteen. Ah, but you see, this is this is where the whole thing goes. But the Privy Council, three five hundred years old. There's a small number are in the cabinet. Mm -hmm. The Privy Council office uh, subscribes to magazines. Mm -hmm. What on earth does that prove? Well, to You're me, spoiling the case. Forg well, forgive but me. The it was Privy a sidetrack introduced by the Council have church. got solicitors. The mm -hmm. solicitors they do have the power. Privy councillors. And the one most powerful to all this was Peter Carter Ruck. The solicitor mm -hmm. to Maybe. the Privy Council. I think, to, 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 and I think we are following a red herring yeah, here. Well, and right, I, right, I, I don't think it's We're drifting from the intelligence. Wait, wait, you will make your point. To yeah. Carry on. Well, I forgot which point I was making. I was wondering, this might be a good time, since we're talking about dirty tricks in Northern Ireland, to introduce these. Now, as part of the dirty tricks operation against the Wilson government in Northern Ireland, uh, which was done in run through Northern Ireland, MI5 sent over various packages of disinformation to a uh, British Army information, a thing called information policy, which was a British Army what psyops. Date, what date was that? This is 1974. Right. I have two of these examples here. One is a completely bogus pamphlet, allegedly written by Dennis Healy, Tony Benn and Stan Orme, yeah. called Economics, Master or Servant of Mankind. Now, in the top right-hand corner, it says non-UK, which meant it was an instruction to the person who handled the material, don't show this to a UK journalist, because any UK journalist would see Dennis Healy and Tony Benn as co-authors of anything and know it was rubbish. 
And there's another one here, a pamphlet, that, a leaflet that was distributed in Northern Ireland in the same year, MI5 again, apparently published by Merlin Rees, Stan Orm, David Owen, and Paul Rose. Now, Paul Rose, of course, is retired as an MP, and Stan Orm, I think, is no, is, uh, no longer really prominent in the Labour Party, but at that point, he was a junior minister, wasn't he, Merlin? He was a junior minister with Northern me. Ireland. Yeah. Now, these are very faded because they've been photocopies and photocopies and photocopies. If you want to see what MI5's misinformation looks like, here are two rather faded examples. This is, if you want evidence, evidence, proof. And Peter Wright touched that much of it. Well, what, is, what is the proof that they come from MI5? That's the point. That's what I'd like to know. Well, the proof in any literal sense, no, I can't. I don't have the originals, so we, we couldn't even go back and have the paper examined. See, I don't believe they you were from believe, MI5. I don't. know about it. Well, who, well who, who did they come from then? Well, the, that they emanated from Northern Ireland at that time. Really? That the, yes, you don't think it came from MI5? Well, I have no, Why not? No, not the slightest reason to believe that they may have come from a disinformation department. See this typeface? It's, what, it's the typeface IRD used as well. I mean, ah, but now that's not MI5, you see. I agree. I said as well. Yes. Now, you see, if you are arguing, now this comes back to my interest. Why is it such a problem to you, Merlin, to accept this is MI5? Because I don't believe it was. Well, but you believe Peter Wright? I, the Peter Wright aspect, I don't be necessarily believe all he's written, no, no, uh, don't but, and I, a lot of other people don't. But, but in terms of Northern Ireland, I do not accept that that came from MI5, that it happened, that uh, it came from other sources, and that it was published in Northern Ireland, and it is complete and utter rubbish. Uh, that published at the time. I mean, obvious rubbish that, that was written sure. there. Sure. But I don't believe it came from MI5. And I believe, in terms of my wider interest, my name bandied about uh, by some nutcase in that, that sort of thing. I feel very strongly about it. And so do other people. And it needs to be looked at. I do not believe it was from MI5. But that's another matter. Well, it ought to be looked at. Another candidate, perhaps. Well, could, could I ask you, Peter, Peter Wright, in his book, <laughs> makes a specific sure. charge that MI5 uh, plotted against uh, Labour government mm. and tried to organise its uh, um, uh, overthrow. Well, um, what are your views about that? Do you think there's anything in that? Or is that something that Peter Wright... Um, I think there's something in it. There wouldn't a have great deal. There wouldn't have had the the um, inquiry in 70, 77 mm. otherwise, and Mrs. Yeah. Thatcher wouldn't have had another one. Right. Um, the, the alleged was, inquiry. The alleged. Well, of course, but, the, but well, let's get it. of course, there's 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 something in it. Whether inquiry. it was related to this <laughs> rubbish in Northern Ireland yeah. is a different matter. Yeah. But the both ought to be. Both ought to be looked at. They're not the interest of the state. Yes, so well, could I come in on that? Because when you said look at these things, investigate these things, you did mention the Security Commission. Earlier, yes. Yes. Now, if we go right back to 1962, Lord Radcliffe's commission sure. on the Vassal Affair, mm. when he was appalled at how easily Vassal could walk out of the Admiralty with secret documents, and he drafted out recommendations to prevent such a thing happening again. Mm. And yet every year since 1962, and I don't exclude any year, every year since 1962, secret documents have been removed from MI5, MI6 and GCHQ without fail. Mm. And the Security Commission has failed to come up with any answer to it. Now, the Security Commission met in 1983 to investigate the Jeffrey Prime affair. Mm -hmm. Until that time, I had been conducting a campaign for 10 years, which had gone right through every channel of the civil service, every channel of government, up to two prime ministers, had been on television. Mm. Uh, Mr. Thatcher had answered questions about it in the House of Commons on the 20th of May, 1980. Uh, more than 100 MPs had signed a, 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 an early day motion asking for a, an inquiry into my allegations. And yet, when the Security Commission met to investigate how Jeffrey Prime could remove documents from GCHQ so easily, mm. no one came near me at all. I wasn't uh, even asked to uh, appear in front of the Security Commission. Now, going on from that, the Security Commission made several recommendations at that time, again, to prevent this happening again. 
And the top recommendation, the first recommendation was that there should be random searches of, of personnel leaving GCHQ and its bases. Mm. That was in May 1983. In the same month, the Prime Minister told Parliament, told House of Commons, that the recommendations had been accepted and would be implemented without delay. Hans, that will confirm this. Yeah. Will be implemented without delay. Mm. We then had the Cyprus affair in 1985, and in 1986, Lord Griffiths, the Security Commission, uh, went to investigate the Cyprus affair. Okay. And when he produced his report in October 1986, yeah. he confessed that he was quite horrified that the recommendation made in 1983 mm. by Lord Bridge's Security Commission still hadn't been implemented by GCHQ three years later. Surprise, surprise. Now, no MP has taken this up in Parliament, and you are there in Parliament. Mm. You haven't taken this up. We've, we've, we have Norman Tebbett, we have Michael Mates, we have Douglas Heard saying how concerned they are that these leaks could harm national security. Mm. Now, that's hypothetical. Here we have factual mm. information because the Attorney General himself, Sir Michael Haber, submitted a case to the courts that 2,000 secret documents had left the GCHQ base in Cyprus and gone to the Soviet Union. Mm. Now, had those recommendations of Lord Bridge been implemented, as the Prime Minister said, without delay, it's most unlikely mm. that those 2,000 documents would have reached the Soviet Union. Mm. And yet, no MP has said a word about this. Well, no MP haven't. has said, said, well, what's happening? Is the director of GCHQ not answerable for this? He is in charge of this organisation. He was given an instruction to implement this recommendation. He failed to do so in three years. And 2,000 documents have missing. Just a moment. Yeah, but what about this MP that you spoke to? Has he yeah, not done Just a moment. Uh, we go on further. Yeah. The recommendation still wasn't implemented a, further, a year later when it was discovered that more documents from GCHQ were turning up in Moscow. Mm -hmm. So in four years, a recommendation by the, the top recommendation by the Security Commission, which the Prime Minister said would be implemented without delay, was not implemented, and numerous documents found their way from GCHQ to Moscow. No one has bothered. We have Douglas Heard saying he's concerned. Michael Mace is concerned. He's always concerned. And, and Norman Tibbet's concerned about hypothetical security issues. They haven't been concerned. None of them has asked. What did Peter Mary Church do about the Lord Bridges Security Commission recommendation in 1983? No one has asked that question, and this is factual loss of secrets to a possible hostile power. It All says. of which confirms me, at any rate, in uh, making bold to suggest that this kind of reform yeah. is going, as one would expect, on the basis of government by cock-up, in exactly the wrong direction. Yeah. This is a license for more things done under the blanket, in the dark, more things left unexplained, more concealment, more yeah. suppression. And this seems to me to be something that the ordinary Joe, looking yeah. at the box at this time of night, ought to be well, a little disturbed uh, in his repose about. I'm disturbed about that in many respects, but the fact of secret and above being under the, um, uh, the criminal law and the rest not. Mm. Not I don't specifically. Believe it is not under the blanket. That doesn't mean to say that one shouldn't look at it, but I really genuinely believe that that is not relevant to the point that you are making, well, which is really quite different from the other if point. On a, on a point of a technical point, secret's gone out of the window. It's now not the specific security grading. It is what somebody assesses as the risk to national security. Now, Al Alistair Mackey, I think it's an important, it important point that you're, you're, you're raising here, but let me try and get something into context before, before you go on with it. I think most people are aware of the three major security organisations. Uh, MI5, which I understand deals with security in Britain, MI6, which deals with security abroad, and GCHQ, which deals with uh, radio communications, intercepts, and so on. What I don't think people do fully understand is where exactly the JIC, the Joint Intelligence Committee, actually fits into that kind of uh, that structure. Can you explain that to well, me? Well, they would have to go, owing to the quirks of the system, and this throws another little light on it, they would have to go to the official history of the intelligence services in World War II, which the final volume of which was published yesterday, and read pages and pages about the Joint Intelligence Committee. Or they could go to Antony Sampson in the Anatomy of Britain, other uh, 
writers of impeccable integrity. What you cannot do is to come to me about it, because if you do, I put myself at risk. Although widely published, celebrated, noised abroad, the Cabinet Office yesterday refused to admit to the existence of that body. So <laughs> I am not going to chance my arm. Well, well, yesterday specifically? Yesterday afternoon I rang the Splendid. Cabinet Office with a view to being able to authenticate myself in some modest way. We believe Thus, you. I can't. <laughs> you must go to the references I have provided. So you rang the Cabinet Office yesterday afternoon yes, and asked... Yes, the press office. And they refused no, to... All I said was I was doing a project perfectly true. Was it a fact that the Joint Intelligence <laughs> Committee existed in the Cabinet Office? And after hanging on an immense period, I got the irrelevant reply wrong, that nothing was said of it in the civil service list. I could have told them that. So I'm afraid I'm at a very serious disadvantage, well, and I shall have, have to. I shall have, have to pray you your. You I shall have to pray your indulgence over this. What but there are authorities. Merlin Rees, you tell us about the Joint Intelligence Committee. What, where, I never did to us. Works on a different net. Well, very briefly, it coordinates. Having pulled your leg a little bit, it coordinates intelligence of all kinds, from all places, so I understand from the publications I read yesterday, of course, of course. <laughs> and it presents the processed intelligence to those government departments which have a concern in implementing policy. Merlin, of course, will have had access to their output from time to time. Does he have access to everything that concerned him in Northern Ireland? I'm thinking of certain politicians that you, my old friend here, such as Sir Knox Cunningham. Mm. He made a lot of trouble in Northern Ireland. He was the man that was, in your day, uh, the parliamentary secretary to the uh, Tory Prime Minister, Hal mm -hmm. McMillan. Mm -hmm. Then he went and started writing for Ian Paisley's Protestant Telegraph sure. in your day. Mm -hmm. yes. He was the man who started telephoning me, saying, I can't do this and that. Why? Because his friend, who had been the... Uh, Tory whip in Northern Ireland government, who appointed himself as, uh, in your day, um, the uh, recorder of Belfast, Topping. Kenneth Topping. Yes, yes. known Walter Topping. I, I think Dream you're losing topping. Merlin Reese, and I think your question to Merlin Reese is an important topping, one. Did, no. did, you feel, <laughs> did you feel, Merlin, in Northern Ireland, uh, and obviously we're moving on slightly here because, uh, mm. because obviously he's not same address we've been mm. discussing here, the two. You can't separate it. D no, you indeed, can't. you can't. Did you feel People that, want to. that you actually received all the information that you needed uh, as the, the Secretary for State in Northern Ireland uh, from the security services over there? I'm not talking about the dirty tricks set up in answering that question. The answer is no. That's later date. In terms of Northern Ireland, it's a different situation, and it's long after Knox Cunningham, long after all the old yeah. establishment in Northern Ireland, you're in a situation by 74 of the IRA of Inlo... No, they weren't formed by then, but the old official IRA before they became a political force or went into politics alone, uh, the UDA, the Red Hand Commanders and all that sort of thing, the trade unions, at least members of trade unions, uh, the Ulster Workers' Council. I was far more concerned with that aspect of things than ever I was with the old True. establishment in Northern Ireland, who by that time... It still time, works today. Well, it may be, but they were irrelevant to my uh, situation. Now, in those circumstances of um, uh, what I was doing in terms of ending detention, uh, in terms of uh, trying to set up a political the convention and all the rest of it, insofar as the security services had any advice to give me, uh, and I don't say that in any downbeat sort of way, what were the views that they picked up around, uh, I found them very sensible. They were not right-wing. Uh, they weren't left-wing. I thought they were very sensible. I can, uh, Whatever disagreements I have, whatever strong views I have, in terms of Northern Ireland, uh, we're talking about five. We're not talking about MI5. other forces. Yeah, I simply say that the advice given to me was sensible, whether uh, it, it's a different scene in Northern Ireland. Um, you see, we've ignored one thing in terms of this country. I must get to that on the side of them. One of the things that's developed since all of this was written is in terms of terrorism, call it what you will, that comes into London from many parts of the world, from the Middle East and so on, and it's important. 
It's important to my constituents. Well, it's it's less important than traffic deaths, Merlin. Pardon? It's less important than traffic accidents. Well, maybe, but I... terrorism is this size. Well, it may be, but it's important. Careful. It's, no, I don't regard it. It's a good it. excuse for the government to do things, but it's not important. Well, I simply tell you, as someone whose family have had police guard for 15 years, yeah. I feel strongly about it. Yeah, okay? It's not important objectively. It's important to me. And it's I believe it's... It's important to me who being many times in intensive care raids of my life. I know what all this is about. I come from Northern Ireland, and so does my friend Montgomery Hyde here. Is there a cover-up in Northern well, Ireland now? Let, let me continue with the terrorism is a... You've said a minute ago, then you go on to that and to something well, else. Do you think this... this is a, well, the, whatever is well, the weakness with that... I'm not a conspiracy theorist. You are you a coincidence are. theorist. But you are a coincidence no, theorist. The you think this is a coincidence? The theory that everything is tied together, in this I case it is. is the reason why we don't succeed in getting particular things How are we to at? do it? You won't do it by the press, and you won't do it by asking questions in Parliament. I what do you suggest we do? I wouldn't do it by the press. What would, you, what would you have us do, then? But, you see, the, take this point that I've heard tonight interests me. The point there, which is not necessarily my field, is, is important as well. What matters, and the third point, is the dirty tricks against the Labour government may be allied with Northern Ireland. And Can those three things are yes, important. Yes, yes, very, very important. Now, I am on your side in all this. I want to see uh, uh, an inquiry into the Wilson government and how dirty tricks were involved in it. Mm. Northern Ireland is involved because one of the people most involved, as far as I'm concerned, is Lord Manbatten. Oh, do tell us. Well, I've talked tonight, uh, you have read letters that were leaked to private eye mm -hmm. from Peter Montgomery, myself. I went to Blessing they Bourne. Open, they were called open letters, it should be said. Yes, I did. But when the reporters first heard of Anthony Blunt, they all rushed off to Blessing Bourne in Northern Ireland. They looked at the guest book. They saw my name, Blunt. They didn't go to other country houses where my friend and I, like Ely Lodge, where you might have seen Lord Mountbatten's name. Lord Mountbatten was very, very much involved. Because he was gay. Is that what you're saying? I Spirit try of... not to bring personal matters into it. What I'm you... concerned with one thing, the downfall of the uh, Wilson government. Connected to it was Martin. a very, very dirty act. Hmm? And this is what is, concerns me, not about who's gay or anything well, else. Wait a minute, the Wilson government didn't in fact gay. downfall. Wilson, Wilson resigned, and as far as I know, he resigned because he planned to resign for years. Yes, he exactly. did, and he got... It was an got, attempt to bring the Wilson government down. He got two reporters separate. from the BBC to look into this. Penrose and Court. Yes, you must remember, Penrose has spent hundreds of hours Absolutely. investigating me. And he's writing at, a new book. Yes. And he, wrote, he mentioned you a lot in his book about Blunt. Yes. Is it helpful to come back to a little bit more of a global, uh, a global look at it? The stock in trade of all these villains and innocents, as they may be, is secrets. And one of the troubles, and it came out in a jocular way a minute ago about the ludicrous secret of the JIC, is our obsession as a nation with secrets and the fact that what would your percentage be? Certainly well over 50% of what is regarded as secret is not secret at all. Mm -hmm. Now, we've got to think of another happening that is happening. We are getting ever more closely linked to America. And in America, we have, of course, the CIA, and we have a sort of comparable publication to the uh, Peter Wright book here, being the doings of one Philip Agee, who blew most of what goes on in CIA. And we heard an account, we read, we could read an account, of what goes on in CIA that makes most of this dirt pale into insignificance. Now, the sovereign rule is that if America does something nowadays, we will trail along behind, like the faithful God, uh, dog tray with a pitiful, pale imitation. And if things go on as they are, it does seem to me that the sort of thing that our friends around this table who know about these things have been talking about is going to get more and more serious and worse. The dirtiness of the tricks is going to get dirtier. 
it does seem to me that the approach should be the other end of the whole uh, telescope, as it were. From this, we should start by seeing whether we can't do an enormous declassification, having a Freedom of Information oh. Act, well, we'd all rather vote for like the American one. But we'd all vote for that. Uh, I yeah. dare say, but I we haven't to told, first, we have not trouble. told our viewers anything about the possibilities uh, of what I referred to earlier on uh, as pinpoints of light. That is a little tiny pinpoint of light, and I'm merely suggesting well, that so it let, should let be considered. Do you, do you think to an extent that what you refer to as rather more horrendous goings on in the United States may in fact be rather more horrendous because there is a Freedom of Information Act, which means that people can get at those facts rather more easily? Absolutely not. The terrible things started happening years before the idea of freedom of, of, of information ever uh, occurred to anybody. The destabilizing, generally speaking, of anything that went towards the benefit of the, ben uh, of the peasants, the poor, the underdogs, instantly labeled as communist. Everything that goes to the greater glory of corporate America, the fellows with the chins round the backs of their necks, the big corporations, government of the rich, for the rich. This country is becoming ever more governed on the same principles, and we eternally suck up to the Americans over everything. Robin My Ramsey, point does, does is that simply that this is a trend and something has got to be done to buck it. Yeah, yeah. Does it ring true to you that it's less important to have a Freedom of Information Act than to combat corporatism? Well, I mean, a Freedom of Information Act would be wonderful. And the American system is wonderful. I mean, right. a, a friend of mine wrote to the CIA and said, please send me information, all your stuff on the coup in Iran which the CIA had a minor part in but claimed all the credit for. And he duly got back 150 pages with a compliment slip saying, from the CIA, mm. and enough to pay for it. And this is a wonderful thing. Sure. But we're never going to get one in this country. Not only are we never going to get one, there is specific so, provision in so. this for information derived in other countries, which is, which is shortly going to come under the sure. same kind Absolutely. of ban no. as everything else. Somebody yes. in my position, my, my view of this is, I'm just going to ignore this. I mean, I have taken no notice of the Official Secrets Act. I've tried, I've tried. The Official Secrets Act to date, and I will carry on ignoring it. And the only way we will get any of this is if the British media collectively muster a little bottle, a little oomph. That'll and be then, the day. And, indeed. And the day this bill, this becomes law, all the serious papers do a simultaneous breach of the law. That would be very nice. And then Mrs Thatcher would be shafted. She'd be stranded. They couldn't, she couldn't bang all editors into jail. That won't happen. All that happened is little people like me with tiny little magazines will go on ignoring this stuff and trying to get out what is happening and what is going on. And, let it be said, fascinating though this is, and important though this is, this is routine. This is not a big, exciting revelation. To somebody like me who's been reading books for the last 10 years, this is now, this is background noise. You know, I mean, you know, we're, you're talking about Ireland, we're talking about the British state employing Protestant assassins, assassination squads knocking off 20, 30, 40, 50 people, setting off explosions. We're talking about basic counterinsurgency running in Northern Ireland. And if you want to know what counterinsurgency is like, look at colonial history. They didn't do anything new in Northern Ireland, they just did it better than they did in Kenya or Malaya. It's the same nonsense. Um, what's his name? Templar in Malaya called them killer squads. We have killer squads, he said. We go out and shoot people. Had them in Northern Ireland. The British army being a bit cleverer than they were in the old days, they used Protestants, gave them the guns, go and shoot a few Catholics. You know, as long that's as what you print is the truth and you've got evidence. Well, as long as you've got evidence and we do our best to you find evidence. You say shaft Mrs Thatcher, but that's, uh, this is not the way to deal with them, I'm afraid. Yes, but you see, well, it's well, the only way I know. It's not the way. Back to that again, well, there's really. no alternative. You guys have all been yeah. doing it in the respectable way for the last 20 years and got bloody nowhere. You see, this but idea of what America does today, we, uh, oh, we will do tomorrow. Sorry. Well, America has the Freedom of Information Act and we are not going to get this uh, because you keep getting disinformation. I sat the other evening and listened to Sir Michael Havers on uh, the other channel. Was he Havering? Uh, he was, indeed. He was, <laughs> he was uh, discrediting the American uh, Freedom of Information. He said it's caused all sorts of trouble over there. Terrible trouble. You see, of course, he didn't elaborate the trouble, you mm. see. It didn't cause trouble for the state. It caused trouble for those who were corrupt, yeah. who were rotten to yeah. the core. Indeed. My, uh, Sir Michael didn't say this, you see, and that's why we won't get that. But then, if we go on to uh, this business, um, we're told, or the public and the media are told, that the reason why uh, we mustn't allow this information to be published is that our allies won't share their secrets with us if it's going to be leaked out. Well, is that not true? Well, oh. <laughs> if it's true, the CIA, the Americans, the FBI, the CIA, have a policy that their ex-agents can write their memoirs 
provided they submit them to the department to be vetted. So therefore, they are doing exactly what Mrs Thatcher will not allow our agents to do. And she's saying, therefore, because of that, then they won't share the secrets with, with us. The reason they won't share the secrets with us is because they know that our organisations leak, not with uh, information like this, but, I mean, you have uh, a proliferation of books from Rupert Allison, from Chapman Pincer, from Christopher Andrew, with all the information about MI5, MI6, GCHQ. Now, if our intelligence services were so leak-proof, these three authors would be out of business. Well, they're not out of business because they're, they're supported by the security yeah, service. Yes, they are course. indeed. So, so they, mean, they, our, our allies know um, this, so that therefore they're not going to... That's obviously a very serious allegation. I mean, I, I think it's fair to say that uh, that, that is a view and that... Of course uh, it is. Fact, it's just my view, you know, yes. That, yeah. that well, is something that they would most Tory MP, A Tory MP writes a book about intelligence agencies and, he, and, you, and you're going to deny there's some kind of official approval? Come well, along. Uh, let it, let, I mean, let, let it be said that he denies that there is any... Of course it's bound to. Let's be honest. I think it's what... I mean, let's not pretend. can't be very good then, can it, if he does it? No. What, Rupert Allison yes. represents uh, one faction in this intelligence war of leaks that's been sure. going on. They've been trying to get their different versions of reality into the picture. Well, mm. we had this He's just a ghost writer. We had the situation that they were trying to, uh, or they are trying, as I understand, to uh, uh, seize the uh, money that Paul Greengrass uh, mm. has made for ghostwriting um, mm. Peter Bright's book. And but, all then, the but then um, Rupert Allison, Chapman Pincer are obviously ghostwriting information they have got sure. from inside the, the intelligence services. So why isn't it an attempt to seize their uh, money mm -hmm. uh, there? But this, this is all... all I think we're drifting thing is, away. This thing, really here, from this, this thing here uh, is, as I said, saying that um, our allies won't share their secrets with it. Well, this just isn't true because the allies have a system where their agents or ex-agents can publish their memoirs provided they are submitted to the department. This could work in this country very easily, but they don't want it to work in this country because there is too much to hide. There's too much behind the scenes. Yeah. Now, in America, the Americans learn from Watergate, and the United States Code of Ethics requires a civil servant to put loyalty to the highest principles of, uh, of moral standards and country above loyalty to person, party, or uh, government. <laughs> Sounds dangerous to me. That is the requirement now since Watergate. But unfortunately, had Watergate happened in this country, it would never have come out. Well, it did. We had our own Watergate and nobody took up. any notice. You had what Watergate was there? and the Van Gate. With yeah, overthrow of Wilson. Yes. Wilson this. said it. Wilson sat there and said it exactly. and nobody took any and notice. This is what I was a want to come back with. Yeah, before uh, before sorry, you do, I'm sorry, I, Jock, I must just ask I Jock Kane one, one, one question, which, mm. it, which emerges in a sense from, the, I think, the point you were building to, and that is the, the definition of national security. Yes. Um, I know it's something you feel very strongly about. You say you're a patriot. You say I, didn't, I don't say I'm a patriot. I believe in, 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 was it Samuel Jordan who said that the patriotism is the last refuge of a rogue, and I've seen it. <laughs> the, I've seen it. The people who say they are patriots are the biggest rogues in the country. Are yeah. you not patriotic to any cause, though? To I any believe high, in my country. Principle? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I, is that I, not patriotism? I, I will correct you, because you said at the start that I was a radio operator with GCHQ. I was a radio supervisor with GCHQ. And I have commendations for the work I did. I achieved those commendations because I believed in the work I was doing. I believed I was working in the best interest of my country. And that is what I believe in. Is and, that not patriotism? And all my campaign, all my campaign and the campaigning I did through Parliament and everything else was to try to seal the information that was flowing from this nation to hostile powers or potential hostile powers. That's what I was trying to do. I'm not saying I was a patriot. I'm saying that I believe in my country, I love my country, mm. and I will do anything mm. I can to aid my country. And you've I'm, I'm very disturbed that at what I blocked. see. I'm very, I'm very and disturbed at what I see going on, and I believe that the same thing should apply in this country because, as I said earlier, we have this uh, ridiculous situation that people who are supposed to be protecting the, the nation's secrets have this policy that uh, they mustn't tell tales in their colleagues. The public school ethic. The public school ethic. And they know that the colleagues are endangering the nation's secrets, but they keep quiet. 
And this is wrong. And this is why I say we should have uh, the same as the US Code of Ethics. I, I understand that. But you see, I, I'm playing devil's advocate here. I mean, it seems to me you're saying you wanted to seal the flow of information yes. that was going to this country's potential enemies, yes. whoever yeah. they may be. Is that not exactly what Mrs. Thatcher says about the contents of Peter Wright's spy catcher book? No, the, the, Mrs. Thatcher says a lot of things, and one of the things she said that Peter Wright did this for money and so on and so forth. Now, I think it's a, an accepted fact that had Mrs. Thatcher ignored Peter Wright's book, Peter Wright would have made very little money from that book. It's not an, an exciting book by any means. There's very little in that book that would interest people outside the perhaps the intelligence community itself. Uh, Peter Wright made money because Mrs. Thatcher got an obsession to try to stop him. And the world said, well, what's this book all about? And all went out to buy it. Ah, exactly but why that. did? You, but you see, the point about that book is the bit that was embarrassing, I think, politically embarrassing about that book was it's only half a page, page and a half, That's right. where Peter Wright confirmed everybody else's allegations from 1976 when Wilson first made them onwards. Now, I mean, there was Wilson, there was Gordon Winchell who worked for Boss, etc. It's a long list. Colin Wallace, James Miller of MI, who came out and said he'd been asked to organise the Ulster Worker Council strike by MI5. And finally, now these are all people you could in some way ignore. Wilson was paranoid. Wallace was, a, you know, was, was had been in prison. Gordon Winter of Boss had been discredited as a liar. But Peter Wright, senior MI5 man. And finally, the, it was accumulation of bits and pieces. Finally, if that got out, then it was going to stick. And it has stuck. I mean, I was pushing out Colin Wallace's allegation, which is very similar to Wright's, six months before Peter Wright ever was ever heard of. And nobody took any notice. None of the media took a blind bit of notice because it was Colin uh, Wallace. Just uh, Peter, uh, Peter Wright had uh, indulged in breaches of security. He was a good deal about communications, which are not very exciting material, but it's got, but not I regard it as top secret. Come material. on, they're not secrets to the Russians. I mean, the Russians aren't that stupid or incompetent. Is it, is it not true, in fact, that actually, I mean, what is, what is in a sense fascinating about this book, I mean, I speak now as somebody who's not an expert, is that uh, is in a sense it has such an amazing ring of truth. The idea of, of people bugging and burgling their way across London and having a lot of fun doing mm. it. And it's in a sense, it's that, that's the, right. it has such a ring of truth. And, and, and if I'm right in thinking that, is that not perhaps, uh, uh, you know, in a sense, why it is, is most dangerous? Not that it has secrets that the Russians would be particularly interested in, but it has a real ring of truth about it. Well, the, the dirty trick set up, I come back, we were on this some mm. time ago. This is very important. I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical about some aspects of Colin Wallace, for example, but so be it. I, the, the dirty trick set up is what I have been concerned about. There's no doubt that the right book uh, would break any official secrets act in some parts of it, and I don't commend it. Um, uh, and anyway, most of it was in um, Chapman Pinchot. Too secret too long. No, uh, not before long that. before. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I certainly am. I hold no brief for that, for, for, for what true. you call him for um, for right. Certainly not. Um, but the allegations that are made by our friends here tonight on a field I know little about, which is your field, but yours I know more about. They are specific things that need to be looked at, and the dirty tricks, which is what I've been on about for some time. I do not believe that we get anywhere by the overall approach. It's only when you keep on to particular issues that I think eventually something will have to be done about it. More information will come out, more people write. That's common sense, I agree with yeah, that. I think, I think actually the other true. point, which is, that if we go on as we are, and in a great sense we are going on as we are with this document, then the way is clear for the sort of thing that Wright alleges to go on. And that is very serious if one is disposed for patriotic reasons to try and improve the intelligence. I think you'll find in that um, that the separate piece of legislation that is to come up on lifelong confidentiality now, that aspect of things which is designed to deal with the issues that we're talking about, that is the important issue. And incidentally, that would get a lot of politicians or statesmen of the past who have certainly not said they had a lifelong confidentiality, whether it's... It would you know, get Arian, delete Arian Eve as well, because Arian Eve went to Colin Wallace in 1976 and said, give me your dirt on the Labour Party. And yes. Was, uh, can this I would bring actually, in a point This would here. actually catch people like... 
uh, Ponting, Everybody. Massiter. Mm. Yes, Everybody. Everybody. You, Everybody. You, you, you Everybody. Feel what sure. Ponting was trying to do? Ponting was trying to be patriotic in, in exactly the terms you described. He saw his duty to the state as above his duty to his ministers. He regarded his ministers as misbehaving, well, rightly I'm, I'm or wrongly. I'm not sure you're right in terms of that. Where I think it is right, uh, you're correct, is in the separate legislation which will come on lifelong Well, I, with great respect, can only go on this. Well, I can and only tell... If Ponting had been tried under this, why he had leaked would never have come out. He had leaked that sufficient. No jury is allowed to consider why he'd leaked. He's guilty. Well, I think you'll bang, find bang. it's the separate legislation, but it's... it's well, I can it, only let, go let, on what me, I can buy. Let me ask you, if I may, a specific question, Mallory, because I think we've, we've, we've discussed and we've talked about the, the, yeah. the white paper in, yeah. in some detail now. You said something a, a while back when, in fact, we were, we were in a, a commercial break. You said you were uh, entirely happy with the way the security services had given you information that, uh, that you needed while you were in Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland. Yes. Um, but you also said... Uh, if I remember your words correctly, that you were unhappy about, I think you said, the British Army's disinformation campaign. Now, well, black propaganda. Black propaganda. Black, yes, I, I mean, I, 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 I've written a book, I haven't in secret, I don't think, in that, uh, I've forgotten the date now, 75, 76, one of those dates, is that uh, when I heard about this black propaganda uh, going on, then uh, I had an inquiry into it, and, and I stopped it. At least I said it should be stopped. <laughs> yeah. Because a black propaganda in Northern Ireland, for heaven's sake, uh, people create their own. You don't need black propaganda with things that go on there. And so, yes, there was black propaganda taking place. It's, it's, not, it's not new. No. It, it no, indeed, indeed. It, you, you would define that as, in a sense, a dirty trick. Oh, well, sure. There were but dirty Marilyn... tricks taking place against people in Northern Ireland, undoubtedly. Merlin Rees, your leader, the main, man who made you... Really? A minister in Northern Ireland, Harold Wilson, was the man who was blacked by the black propaganda. Was he not? But he himself started an inquiry, and yet it was he who withdrew from it, from the Penn Court inquiry. He stopped it. The, the, the Pen, Why did he the, the, withdraw? The, 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 let me yes, The Penn Court is a journalist's inquiry. I, I certainly can't help uh, on that. <laughs> what we're talking about, what we were talking about a moment ago, was a dirty tricks uh, set up, not just against, not against British politicians alone, if that took place, but certainly it took place against people in Northern Ireland. That's the precise issue yes. Yes, yes. We, we were talking about. And that didn't come from MI5. I'm, I, I, I defend what I know. Mm. Mm. But, that, but that there was uh, a black propaganda set up in Northern Ireland, I have checked since, because I was concerned about it, and. Uh, I am told, always told, that the thing uh, has ended. But uh, that, that's it. Do you, do you believe that? Yes, I believe that that unit uh, has been folded up. Yeah. Gary, mind? I like your um, expression about the umbrella, and I, I think we should target specific incidents. Can I um, put to you um, that perhaps the security service or agents of the security service operating on the mainland have been responsible for murder? blackmail, and some other well, general that. types of offences. Can I put to you um, that there's a private company operating out of London who uh, are former intelligence officers, and their company is constructed in such a way that they are virtually a private SIS, private CIA. And I've got here an actual extract from the company file, which is in my possession, and I read from the the objects, uh, a special resolution from the Memorandum of Association. It reads as follows, to carry on business as security experts or agents and to provide advisory and consultancy services to governments or other authorities, local, municipal or otherwise. That's not t too horrific at the moment, but it goes on to read, and to promote and encourage the adoption of security and precautionary measures against the incidents of industrial and other espionage, hmm. including the installation and operation of electronic devices, TV receivers and transmitters, microphones and amplifiers, sound recording machines, and remote control devices. This is a private company yeah. of detectives and security consultants operating in London. Sure. And their directors 
I can link direct to Whitehall. I'm not going to say for yeah. obvious reasons. But you say saying they're involved in murder? Um, I'm s no, don't Sorry, no, no, but you... Um, I'm saying, w how do you feel about the allegation that the security services or agents such as this organisation, private firm, would go out and carry out acts of murder? I think it's... it's, it's, it's do you it's think a, that's unlikely? It, no, 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 I don't know about unlikely, but it's a very serious allegation. And well, this it, company exists. The directors are very well-known figures. But, they, but, but let me get it absolutely clear. That a firm may exist that mm -hmm. advises companies, foreign companies, on how to safeguard their directors and all the, in foreign countries, mm -hmm. or industrial espionage, which is a modern phenomenon and so on, is one thing. But I want to be absolutely clear mm -hmm. that you're saying that this firm exists with government contacts at the highest level. They employ criminals with criminal convictions for unlawful sexual intercourse, grievous bodily harm, and a member, a member of an organization on subcontract to this firm was recently prosecuted for wiretapping a diplomat who a week after the wiretapping offense was shot dead. You'd better let me give me some information that I can take it up. It's a very, oh, it's, this is the tip of an iceberg. This very same firm activated a covert surveillance on the anti-nuclear protesters at Sizewell. Gary, let's be just very, very clear about this. You're suggesting that this firm on Zoo, a freelance Zoo Security, basis. let's spell it out. Zoo Security, folks. I'm Whitehall suggesting a firm exists in London. And on a freelance basis, is it, it is employed by the British state in some shape, manner or form. I'm saying that its directors have contacts to the highest level in Whitehall and to British intelligence. But, but let's, let's just be clear here, because uh, I mean, if you're saying they have contacts to, quote, the highest levels, what exactly does I'm that mean? I'm choosing my words very carefully for obvious reasons. I'm, I'm not like Mr. Ramsey, who will just say anything. <laughs> He's a very brave man. No, I, I understand, but I mean, but, but, I'm but equally, equally you, you, what one needs the allegations to in some way stand up. Now, I mean, The allegations have been published generally. Nothing was done about it. People were named. Former very senior intelligence officers and special branch officers who, are, who were directors of the company were named, but nothing at all was done about it. But unpublished information confirms that directors of this company are also directors of other companies connected to and working for um, the nuclear industry and other areas of government. Well, clearly this, this firm is not actually uh, represented here this evening, so clearly no. any, any allegations... This is why I wouldn't mention their name. Of course, have to, have to be that much But I'm just interested in Mr. Reese's um, um, feeling yeah, about... Yeah, I mean, uh, Mr. Reese, I mean... That's got, got the, to be investigated. Uh, well, it's a very serious... But most of it's been around for, what, three years now? In bits and pieces it's been around for about three years, but no one has actually presented you the have. whole... I, I, I've and got you'll it. give me the information. I'm not saying I will. We'll talk about it. I don't know what you're well, going to do with it. <laughs> I will. I will. Merlin, we're up to here with this kind of information. We're awash with it. There's not more yeah, this, stuff. This is lots of this. This is murder. So, what did it, I mean, what was going on in Ireland? Well, there? hold on. We're not finished there. What about the, the lady in Staines, who was the wife of a nuclear submariner who made a complaint to the Ministry of Defence? She knocked a knock at the door at midnight. Two special branch men, or so they said, kicked the door in beat the lady up, ransacked the house, and put her in hospital. Who's going to investigate that? She's made the complaints to the authorities, but nothing's happened. Huh. I mean, they're terrible allegations, and they've got to be looked at. That's what everyone says, and people but then, look and... But then, but you a minute ago said to me, perhaps you'll give me them, perhaps you're not. Well, we'd have to talk about it. I don't know. I, I've had so many people interested in what I'm doing, and at the end of the day, nothing's done about it. Is this another occasion? I don't know. I mean, I, one, needs, great one needs to, to get in touch with the Home Office straight away. They're very serious allegations. The Home Office. I mean, what's going to but, but, is, is, yeah. it, is it true? That, I mean, I, mean I, think, I think certainly in some countries, I mean, the United States, for example, there are clearly a, a wide range of independent freelance companies that operate on the periphery of, of this kind of area. Now, uh, 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 I mean, without making any judgment as to whether it's morally acceptable or otherwise, in your experience, is it true that, that companies do exist in Britain, private, in, uh, private companies that exist to, to service either this state or the other state, or, or any other state, in, in terms of uh, intelligence matters, security matters, and such like? All I know, uh, specifically, is that uh, I know of a company, because it's been written about, that advises uh, foreign firms, mainly maybe firms here, about if they're operating in certain parts of the world, what steps to take to say to protect their what steps they should take to protect themselves from kidnap 
KMS. And control wrestling. No. There's a long list of them. That, that sort of thing. It's all part of the privatization no, program. Of them. This is privatized CIA and English and criminals. There is also an organization oh, minute, which specializes in writing Why down the names of CND well, members and their activities. The firm this you're is talking fringe. About employs criminals. Hmm. It's terrible. Yeah. Terrible. Well, <coughs> I mean, uh, there's nothing hang on a minute, Merlin, uh, you asked a point about this, you know, these firms that do private contracting for other governments like KMS, Keeney Meany. Well, there's nothing new, uh, there are if I can break uh, it down. Last I heard, I was told there are, there are 50, going on. 50 such companies um, in London. For a very considerable time. All with contacts uh, with British intelligence and they're doing dirty trick operations, carrying them out. Whether or not it's a service operation or whether or not the individuals in MI5 or 6 are just stepping outside of their guidelines. Well, as far as I'm concerned, they can know. advise who they like. But in terms of their operations that you're saying, they're very serious allegations that, that must be investigated. We are saying that as well. <laughs> these, these have been made over and over again for the last 10 years. But they've been made to me. First I've heard of them. Well, that sounds like a very fair offer. That sounds as if you two gentlemen and, and Jock Kane have the kind of serious allegations that Merlin Reese accepts are serious. Then but these allegations have been well, around. Hang on a minute. What's Merlin going to do? He doesn't want to go to the press. And he won't ask questions in Parliament. But ask him. But, but you must allow me. Well, what else? I you rarely do? ask questions in Parliament. I've never found that uh, questioning, written questions sometimes, of course I do it occasionally, uh, the Prime Minister's questions. That's not the place to make these sort of allegations. They, they, I need to be in. I mean, seriously, when you tell me and when you get to the point of murder, because that's what you say, then I well, must... I didn't say this company had been involved in murder. I... Ah. Not specifically this company. Ah. I must correct you there. I'm saying companies similar to this, I'll give you this as an example, have been involved well, in somebody murder. somebody knocked off Hilda Morrell. I know. Well, can, can, can I can't say it was this company. No, we don't know no, who did it. You mustn't say as it was this company. As far back as 1938, after Munich, um, th there were two individuals who volunteered to assassinate Hitler. One was uh, Mason McFarlane, who was our, our military attaché in Berlin. The other was my wartime chief in New York. He was, was then living in England and um, uh, was a director of a company called Press Steel, Sir William Stevenson. Well, he was Mr. William Stevenson then. Well, both of these gentlemen uh, uh, volunteered to assassinate Hitler and uh, they were informed by Lord Halifax, who was then uh, a foreign secretary, that um, diplomacy had not yet been superseded by assassination. So let me, let hang me on ask you. Let wasn't me ask BSC, you. The, you were in America working for BSC with Stevenson. Didn't you assassinate people in America? Didn't BSC knock people off in America who were opposed to America joining the war? You well, I think one, one was in, on a ship. Uh, as far as I know, it was only, only, only one. Only one? I only know of on, on, on one, one on Just a ship one. who had been in giving uh, information to the, the, the enemy. But this should be said that in well, 1939, what, what, Why was this chap assassinated? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't get that. What, what, you, what, only one man was assassinated? Uh, uh, to my knowledge, in, in the United States, by the... Uh, British security coordination, which was under the direction of William Stevenson, um, there was one seaman on a, 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 a neutral ship, I think it was a Portuguese ship, who was detected giving information to the Germans, and as far as I know, he was liquidated. But I only know this that is one wartime. case. No, this is before this is America the joined the war. Well, before well, America, the United States, States hadn't come into the war then. But I mean, you know, say, but this was this was. Uh, it was in, America, in, least, in broad uh, general terms, you were involved in Operation Intrepid, the, which, as I understand it, was an attempt to to get the United States to join the war. Well, very much so. Yes. Right. D did in Operation Intrepid not consist in, in very broad and general terms, of a series of essentially dirty tricks? Yes, I don't know if there were any dirty tricks. There were. Um, Various um, uh, persuasive effort uh, persuasive. made, persuasive. and with the help of uh, men like uh, General the Donovan, um, uh, American destroyers were offered to the British and accepted in return for bases in the Bermuda and the Caribbean. But um, 
There were any specific dirty tricks. I mean, I well, well, is it not true that that, uh, that British intelligence uh, and uh, please again, well, I, I, I make no what you mean by, by dirty tricks. I mean, um, uh, two of the things which British intelligence uh, uh, did through one of their agents was uh, to to um, capture the Italian naval ciphers and also uh, the Vichy French uh, ciphers. The Italian ciphers helped uh, the Battle of. Uh, Cape Matapan to... Uh, well, that's not dirty I'm sure tricks. that's not dirty tricks. No. What, what about forged letters? What about uh, uh, blackmail? Uh, there, there was... Um, I don't think there was blackmail, but there were certainly fabricated uh, documents, Just fabricated letters. There was um, uh, one letter which uh, uh, apparently emanated from the Bolivian uh, minister uh, uh, in, in Berlin to uh, the uh, Bolivian Prime Minister um, su suggesting that the Germans should um, be encouraged to take over um, Bolivia. But you see, um, this important... Uh, this was significant because into uh, what, it, what it meant was uh, the Germans threw the Bolivians out. It's from a tungsten was yes. used to... Uh, strengthen uh, air aircraft. No. Uh, wait, wait. There, is a, there is a point here, and I think you're right, and I think Mr. Hyde's forgotten his own book, Room 303. If you read that alongside a man called Intrepid, you will see there was indeed a fairly serious campaign of d disinformation and dirty tricks in North America aimed at the isolationist opponents of America joining the war. It was done by the British state, the British government. Uh, perhaps I could just finish and say that the re result of this letter was that um, um, the um, German... Um, uh, mission in La Paz, the capital of Bolivia, was closed down and the Germans were uh, turned out of the country. And um, the actual document, which I mentioned, uh, was delivered to President Roosevelt, who read it out in one of his far side chats. Indeed, indeed. And indeed. the uh, individual who was responsible for uh, producing this document, which was written in the kind of Spanish um, that uh, was customary in Bolivia at that time, was your humble servant. And did you work with Cecil Roberts on this? Uh, uh, no, not Cecil Roberts. Cedric Belfridge was the chap. Cecil Roberts wasn't. Uh, let, let, let me ask this. Uh, do, do we feel, okay. is, it, is, it, is it a general feeling that in fact these kind of dirty tricks and in inverted commas are perhaps perfectly legitimate if the cause is right? I mean, in wartime. Yes, but in yes. wartime, but America wasn't at war. I mean, uh, this you can just... will not do. We, we have a government that specializes in moralizing, which, which quotes Indeed. scripture out of context Indeed. on vote hunting tours in Scotland Indeed. where Tory votes are <laughs> now a threatened species. We have lofty sentiments expressed on all sides, and I really do not think that what we have laughingly been describing as dirty tricks, and dirty they are, can be justified because they achieve certain ends. And all those moral sentiments look even sillier than they do normally in the light of what we've been discussing. And if we've done nothing else tonight, we've done a very useful service in that respect. Do you think well, the Russians do not uh, I actually feel... engage in dirty Oh, of course they do. Of course they do. All I'm saying time, is that they? they do not have a monopoly of dirty tricks. Mm -hmm. And my other point is that I really don't think we ought to condone them because they happen to work. That isn't really the test. But you, but and you, I would, at that time, you, you and I at that time were trying to kill people, kill Germans. Yeah. Yes, we were trying to kill people under a very different ethic oh, known as the just war, which oh. seems to me altogether <laughs> another discussion. I see. Well. So it does seem to me that the, the, the whole, no, a great part of what one hears about the intelligence services is so unpleasant that I repeat what we ought to be doing is trying to shrink them by reducing the requirement for them until it dwindles to a point at which we can wrap them up all together. Now that's, I admit, somewhat off it. I wouldn't agree with that. I wouldn't agree with that at all. We need intelligence services. On the part of British intelligence, we need intelligence in the United States, in Washington, New York. I say that we need intelligence services. 
Well, he uh, would, we wouldn't have, he? We have glasnost and everything else now, but we can never trust any other nation. Uh, there's a well-known editor of a, a quite conservative supporting paper who has who wrote in 1979 that if there was a Labour government in this country with a hard left leaning, he would quite happily uh, join the Americans to try to subvert that government. Mr. Warsaw, and, I think. And, and I think this is very wrong because if we call ourselves a democracy, whether we like the government in office or not, we accept it. Uh, but unfortunately, a lot of people are of this faith. Mm. Uh, whether they be left or they be right. In both, both camps, there are people who are not prepared to accept democracy. Um, but getting back to intelligence services, uh, it's, it's very often forgotten that the only mistake the Russians have made was to invade Afghanistan, because the Russian philosophy was to convert the world to communism without spilling one drop of Russian blood. And this is still their intention. And rubbish. they will go on doing this. They will go on <laughs> doing this. You may say rubbish. That's all very well. Now, what we have, we have penetration of all our intelligence services. We have penetration of our civil service. And we have penetration of every industry which is working for the Ministry of Defence. Now, this has been proved by American intelligence. It won't be let out by MI5 or MI6 because it's, it slaps them in the teeth. And one of the things which concerns me in this, in which we have these discussions about investigating this and investigating that, and things which are out quite clearly in the open, which are harmful and are not investigated, is this fact. You have spoken tonight about blackmail. How have our services been penetrated? All right, in the past ideology, but the favorite communist weapon, the favorite Russian weapon is blackmail. And we've seen it happen time and time again. Now, and recent, ours recent, too. recently we have seen in the, the papers that um, firms working for the Ministry of Defense have made excess profits of 100 million pounds. And they refuse to cooperate with the Accounts Committee. They refuse to open the books on these things. But the last figures I saw was that 740 senior civil servants from the Ministry of Defence retired with a handsome gratuity, a good pension, and quite a few with knighthoods, and moved into these industries, which they had been working closely with whilst in the Ministry of Defence. These industries, as I've already said, the American intelligence has shown quite clearly that they are deeply penetrated by the BPK, which is the KGB Industrial Espionage uh, Organization. So therefore, if there's any dirty tricks, I'm not saying everyone is in dirty tricks, but I'm saying there must be some. If they are dirty tricks, then the BPK are aware of it, and the KGB are aware of it, and people are being blackmailed. This is where the penetration of our intelligence service and our civil service is taking place. Ideology is gone now, but blackmail has taken its place. You are confusing two quite distinct things. Yes. One is the obsessive and well-known Soviet curiosity and their true paranoia because they think everybody's plotting against them. Which, which is are. why, indeed, which is why, <laughs> which is why they pop up at every conceivable corner doing just the things you say. Mm -hmm. But that is profoundly different from mm. the 30-year out-of-date notion that such is the quality of communism as a creed that it can only be a question of time before it converts the whole world. The Soviets have long since given up communism as any use at all for any practical purpose, let alone thinking they can sell it to anybody else. Sure. What they are doing is not penetrating and subverting, they're penetrating and investigating and doing all the other awful things that we've been talking about because they are terrified just as the Americans, and indeed ourselves, are terrified. And therein is a, another root problem which, thank God, we're not trying so to solve don't, tonight. You don't I, see the Soviet Union as, as, as any kind of threat. You've, you've never 
in your career seen any kind of information which suggests to you realistically that the Soviet Union is a threat? To no, no, country? you're using never in my career. That's 40 years. I am saying that, let us say, over the last couple of decades, the notion about corrupting, corrupting institutions in this country, what have we got left? A few moth-eaten old trots. Really, that's all there is mm. to deal with. That's one thing. Quite another, no, party. quite another are all the dirty tricks which get played, and I say that the motive behind them is an obsessive, paranoid curiosity, and a determination, of course, to be ready to counter if, as they fear, we, mainly the Americans, because we're only ciphers in this, we go for them. That is what is motivating them, and if you go to respectable American organizations, the Brookings Institution, for instance, which is a highly respectable organization, they will tell you, and indeed I'm simply parroting what they say. Can, can I, I say bring something back about to the question of loyalty? Uh, MI5, MI6. Uh, the first time I was interviewed by Special Branch was in the 50s, when the Russian leader... Tower Records brings you the unmistakable music of Julia Fordham with her new single, Happy Ever After. Happy Ever After is also available on her debut album, Julia Fordham. Out now on LP, cassette and CD from Tower Records, Piccadilly Circus and Kensington High Street. Exactly who is Don Swan? He's a charismatic and occasionally aquatic character. Every morning he tunes his body by swimming a couple of lengths. Don's love of the sea is even reflected in the location of his modest little club, where anyone, anyone wearing a tie that is, can enjoy a couple of pints of draft swan light, a fully brewed lager that's low in alcohol. It's perfect for a man who has a busy afternoon ahead of him. Anything's possible when you swan lightly. Araldite fillers mend and fill metal and wood. So don't stick it. Araldite it. Germanine 2 is a light, easily absorbed cream that contains an effective antiseptic. It also contains a mild local anaesthetic that gently soothes the pain away. Better now? Germanine 2. There's no better first aid cream. It was his idea. We all come down to do it all. They got it all here. Their displays of Dr. Sells. They make this twist and shout. You can take home a free wallpaper sample to help you decide on the perfect match. You can use the free woodcutting service for all different sizes. And for practical help, take away free how-to leaflets. How to do it all, do it, what they do it for. Tell us where all is, if only we knew it, how do it all do it. We'd also have a whole big store of ideas. <laughs> Special Edition Peugeot 205 Junior. Best to be the rush. Where shall we go next week? <laughs> the Royal Tournament. We'll take the tube to Earl's Court, so we won't have much to shell out. He was a 
freelance, wasn't he? He wasn't on staff at that time. He was not at that time. He was freelance. He was, and he was, he was far past. He was much too fat. He was. Gary, you were. Um, I mean, you mentioned freelance operators there. Something which I know you've done a, a lot of work on is an investigation into the death of Hilda Murrell, who was, of course, uh, an anti-nuclear campaigner. Um, uh, what exactly is your theory uh, on her death, and how exactly do, do freelance operators working for the security services actually fit into that? Um, well, my theory is probably a little stronger than a theory because uh, there is a lot of evidence I've uncovered which will um, more than suggest that private investigators, oblique security consultants, monitor the activities of the Sizewell anti-nuclear protesters and others f and others for over a year prior to the death of Miss Murrell. And I have lists of the and the original reports from the instructing detective agency. And many of Miss Murrell's friends are on that list, although Miss Murrell's name is not. But um, the standard method of operation is if you compile um, a dossier on a suspect's uh, friend, on, on certain suspects, you check out who their friends are. Standard practice. So it would have just been a matter of time before her name would have um, popped in the frame, as they say, in police circles. But um, mm -hmm. a criminal was initially employed on, on that investigation, a man with terrible criminal record. Um, this is by a freelance company. Yes, by a freelance company, and the actual instructions at that time, again, I quote from the report, the actual official instructions from the primary detective agency involved, I, I read as follows, client wishes to ascertain the identities of the principal objectors at the Sizewell Atomic Power Station hearing. If possible, obtain a list of objectors, their connections with the media, political leanings, etc. Of course, it's on record that this company um, said, oh, it's a commercial investigation, um, private client, we were looking for, I think a number of excuses have been given, lost documents, um, fraud, something like that. But from my experience, in about 15 years involved in this kind of work, that kind of information would have only been useful to an official intelligence agency. Meaning? Uh, well, at the, on, on that occasion, I mean, we're looking at various agencies because Miss Morrill was also the sub subject of an inquiry by Navy security because of her nephew's positive vetting. But in terms of her anti-nuclear activity, what, I what would the suggest agencies you'd be thinking in terms of? I would suggest at the time she died, she was under surveillance or investigation by a number of agencies. In addition to, to that, private operatives were actually hunting to see what information she had. Um, which she was going to reveal at the Sizewell hearing. I would suggest MI5 and the nuclear police were also monitoring And the which police? Nuclear police, the British Atomic Energy Constabulary. And yeah, also... Created by Tony Benn, I suspect. T tell me two things. Well, f first of all, um, was she really that significant and that important? She what wasn't was she murdered. All this she wasn't murdered. At the security service. No, I, well, in my, no my way. first question, before we get on to the actual murder itself, my first question is this: Why, why, why was Hilda Murrell being investigated so apparently thoroughly? If you're, if you're well, theory let's is take the, the 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 nuclear connection to start with. Um, we have a situation where um, arguments are taking place about the, the installation of PWRs at Sizewell, um, the nuclear industry, the biggest, most powerful industry in the world, in my opinion, and certain companies in America were reliant upon the installation of. Their, their product at Sizewell. Westinghouse. I don't have to say the names. We've got him here. <laughs> it's all there. Well, you know, I mean, you know, let's be adults. Let's talk okay, about well, it. Okay, well, I'll tell you what. I, I'll be diplomatic. And, you, and I'll, I'll put my foot in it. Yeah, you put your foot in it. Um, and here we have an old lady, um, not any old lady, an intelligent, articulate old lady who went about her research very thoroughly and actually uh, drew together a paper which was going to reveal a tremendous weakness in this particular... Um, PWR, and she was going to present this paper at the Sizewell hearing. That's nothing to do with MI5 or anybody else. Well, hold on. So yeah. you hold say, on. but it ain't so. Hold on. This is not so. Mm. And I, I can argue this. Uh, I know the company very well. Very, I know the company who actually instigated the surveillance, and I know their contacts in government. I know who they were. I know where they are now. And she had to be monitored because they didn't know. You know what government departments are like anyway. If there's any doubt, they go out hunting. Now, this old lady prepared two papers. One paper, which was eventually put to one side, and then an altered paper was prepared. And on the morning, I think it was the 21st of March, uh, 21st, 22nd of March, she went out shopping, 
and um, I can cover her movements up until that time. But when she came home, just prior to midday, 10 to 12, whatever, and there was someone in the house, which is a matter of record, that was not a security service operative. That was a member of my former profession who decided to I go in. A freelance operative. A freelance operative. Now, how do you know that? I've got three names of suspects. Suspects, inverted commas, exclamation marks. I think it's worth throwing a little light for the benefit of our viewers Please. on the general point of what happens because of the obsessive fear of the activities of CND that mm. some members of the public have. One thinks of Mr. Edward Lee of the Conservative Party, who in 1986 asked a question which so combined comedy, ignorance, and boot lick spittle subservience as to be a marvel worthy of record. Asking Mrs. Thatcher whether these brutes in the CND were not, quote, Lenin's dupes, unquote. <laughs> there are 400,000 odd people, and at that time there may well have been more who feel, as I for one do, that Britain's nuclear defense policy is insane. And it does not follow, of course, that we are anybody's dupes. However, to get back to the main point, there is a celebrated instance of a lady called Madeleine Hay, who had the temerity uh, to write to a local newspaper uh, putting the CND case. And she, for 18 months, was harried not by MI5 directly, but by the special branch, who descended to every conceivable level of smearing and dirty tricks and keeping her in suspense. And I'm sure she won't mind by saying that she is a very ordinary, very nice English housewife whose sole offense is to think, as I and many, many thousands of other and people other do, about what I've said. Of course, yours is far and away worse, but I just wanted to throw a little yeah, light no, on the general question. Uh, w w tell me, was, was Hilda Murrell, in any sense of, of the word, doing anything wrong? Nothing immoral, nothing illegal, nothing unethical. She was just a citizen exercising her democratic rights to protest at the Sizewell hearing. Not even protest, just present a paper. She wasn't an active protester. She wasn't a tenacious lady who went cutting through fences, etc., etc. I think she only ever attended one or two um, CND How meetings. Did she, die? she died at the hands of a mysterious burglar. Well, burglar you, who... you took us to, to the point, I think, in the narrative where it's, it's 10 to 12. Take us on beyond there to explain to... Well, she arrived there. home, and it, again, it's a matter of record. Someone was in the house. Um, there was allegedly a struggle, according to forensic reports and police reports, and she ended up two days later found dead in a copse in Shrewsbury. And from that point on, there was all kinds of suggestions that security service had done it, uh, Belgrano angle, this, that, and the other. But I don't believe it was the Belgrano at all. I believe it was the nuclear industry, not directly responsible. They, and I know they still employ private investigators and security consultants to monitor the activities of um, protesters. One of them confessed in court as he went to jail for a wiretapping operation that he wiretapped the size of protesters. Two or three lines in the observer, no one says anything, no one follows it through. This was a separate case? A yeah, separate case, and this man confesses to working for MI5. I wiretapped the size of protesters. I worked for MI5 and did this up in Liverpool. He goes to jail on another offence, but... No one follows this through at all. Okay, Gary, now, you'll, you'll forgive me, I'm sure, for playing the devil's advocate here, but mm. the, the reality is that I'm not quite sure that I see where the evidence is for the step that takes us beyond 10 to 12 in, in what remained of Hilda Murrell's life. She came home, there was somebody in her home, yeah. her body is found, as you say, two days later. Now, where is the evidence that that was... 19 days later, outside of outside of the home of um, a director of the company who in instigated the surveillance, um, a company director directly responsible for the surveillance of the anti-nuclear protesters, Including shot himself. I don't know that, I'm not saying that. So this is, this shot is just himself. the other group. Yeah. And prior to dying, he spoke to a number of people explaining that he was in terrible trouble. Uh, he didn't know what to do. Something, and these are his words, something has gone terribly wrong and he put a gun in his mouth and shot himself outside the home of another director who was responsible for the surveillance on the Sizewell protesters. Now a tape recording exists made by one of the investigators responsible for the Sizewell surveillance 
confessing that the surveillance carried on for one year from 1983 up until the death of Morrill, and his words were, it went all the way to Whitehall. And that tape recording exists today, in the, in, it's in possession of a newspaper. And this man is a private investigator, he's got a criminal record, and he's confessed to me and others that he was working, and has worked for a long time, for the Home Office. For the Home Office? He works for the police. No, for the, I'm using his words. I do the dirty tricks the Home Office do not want to be associated with. You can make of that what, what you want. Those are his words, not mine. And well, the, I, I just, I mean, this is, we can come back to that. I mean, I think this is terrific and very important. But there was a point I wanted to make when Jock was talking about uh, the Russian subversion, which I think is important and it's worth making, that by, by what you said tonight, I don't know you, but you don't sound like you're a lefty. By no means. Right. Peter Wright is as far to the right as it's possible to imagine. The other, the other current people who... Well, are there's Yes. There's the other current people who have been whistleblowing loud and long, Colin Wallace and Fred Horroyd, who I know. They're both loyal Queen and Country men, conservatives, conservative voting conservatives. All the great, all the current serious whistleblowers, or we would be whistleblowers, are all on the right. Mm. All the great spies and all the great traitors have been professional intelligence officers. And the point, the conclusion of all this is what I would make is that when people offer the idea of parliamentary accountability of some kind of the security services, the British state says, oh God, basically, we can't trust them. And yet, you know, who are the people blowing the whistle? The right wingers. And who are the, who are the, who are the leaks? The leaks are all professionals. Then why not trust the politicians? They're the only people who haven't done any serious damage as far as one can see. That was my point. How do you explain that, Jock? Because there are other people I know who you've been in touch with who are perhaps of a, of a, of a like mind. I mean, well, it, it is strange, isn't it, the point that, that Rob is making? That's exactly what we've been trying to put across. The people who are bringing these out are concerned about the betrayal of the country, the betrayal by people in authority, by senior civil servants, by politicians. Uh, People like myself have taken every possible step. We've gone through, we didn't run to the press at the start. We didn't run to start to write books at the start. We went through channel after channel. I went through every official step, one step at a time, right up to two prime ministers. So but no one, no one wanted to know uh, because it was politically embarrassing. Now the thing which I fail to understand is why it should be embarrassing to a government in power when they find that there's a traitor in MI5 or MI6 or GCHQ. It's nothing to do with the government in power, but the opposition seem to think it is. The opposition make a great case of all this. Politicians, if they are as genuine as they profess to be and they put their hand in heart and say we're concerned about national security when they are in office, if they are as genuine as they think they are, they should un unite on national security. All right, have the differences. Uh, ideological differences by all means, but when it comes to national security, this is where we fall down with the states. In America, the politicians don't take advantage of the people breaking national security. They unite. The Democrats and Republicans unite when it comes to America. You have, the term you quoted earlier, patriotism in America, genuine love of their own country. They unite, they don't take advantage. Here, the first thing that an opposition does is shout out, the government's got it all wrong when they find out. And I'm talking about not this government, but also the last government. The opposition, not only to, they're, they're gleeful that the uh, national secrets have been lost. It's a chance to hammer the government. And this, to my mind, is treachery. They should unite and say, what can we do to get this? And I, I come back when I was talking Isn't to, the problem for them, though, that in a sense, that there isn't uh, a, a consensus view of what the national interest Indeed. actually is. Right. Robin, could we come well, back to your question, or rather what you said about uh, Northern Ireland and Manbatten earlier? I uh, rather contradicted you in refusing to talk about Manbatten and the gay thing. I'm only concerned about Manbatten in one thing, and that is what we've talked about, the Watergate. Was he part of that Watergate? Well, he was, he was, all we know is that for sure he was involved in the conversations in 68 with Cecil King and yes. um, the, the Zuckerman. That's all I know for sure. Can we separate Lord Manbatten from Peter Churchill? 
don't even know who Peter Churchill is. No, he's Who's Peter Churchill? Peter Churchill uh, wrote, a, he was in the middle of writing a book at this very time, with my help and Lord Mountbatten's, and the still living uh, uh, person who ran the Queen's archives. Peter Churchill was the man who set up Marlon. Merlin Reese will probably tell you in 1934, the political uh, bureau for the Labour Party. That is a man who wrote for 30 years for the New Statesman. He was a Churchill, but very, very much of the left, if you read his book, I, I, All My Sins Remembered. I think we should be I, very careful what we're saying about uh, Lord Zuckerman and Peter Churchill, because neither of them are here this evening. And I think that clearly... I know nothing about it. I, I mean, I, and I think, in fact, actually, it's, it is something of a red herring in terms of, of, of what we're discussing. It's a cover-up in Northern Ireland. Yes, I think, I think actually... Uh, and we he have, brought up the name of a man who's still very much alive, who knows a lot about it, Colin Wallace. Mm -hmm. People are discrediting Colin Wallace mm -hmm. because certain things, black propaganda, he put around. He res resigned, as his friend Fred did. Uh, they cannot be dismissed. After all, you must remember I've been involved, was involved so many years, in, well, two years in the war with black propaganda, selling black propaganda to Germany. Some of the greatest black propaganda to Germany. Now, Colin Wallace was more or less engaged for the same sort of thing in Northern Ireland. And he came across very interesting evidence about Mountbatten, including certain things about his death, which have not been uh, disclosed. There was a quarrel in the house amongst two of the servants. We don't fully know about it. People don't want to know about it. Uh, Merlin Rees, uh, as Secretary of Northern Ireland, must know and must regard it as a very serious matter that this man, Mountbatten, was once a friend of Wilson, turned against him, and what I regard as one of the most serious things in the last 50 years, getting rid of a prime minister illegally. That is the Watergate. Is, water is, is that your experience, Merlin Rees? I mean, was Lord Mountbatten a friend of...? No, I, I, I know nothing about that. I mean, there's no point. I, uh, I don't know. So, OK, well, let, 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 let's, let's move on then. Uh, I, I mean, I think, um, I think the point that the point that uh, you were trying to make earlier on uh, w w was an important one when uh, uh, when Robert came in. Do you want to sort of pick up that point? And, Which and one? <laughs> it, was, it was the point after well, John Well, the Cain point is that the whistleblowers are on the right, that the, all the great traitors are professional intelligence officers, and the politicians are more or less blameless thus so far. I mean, there have been no great traitors discovered in Parliament. There have been one or two minor figures like w uh, Will Owen, who was you know, making a lot of money for giving the check checks what they knew already. Tom Tryberg. I mean, tell, tell me this. On, on Colin, oh, just, just, just a moment. Just a moment. On Colin Wallace. Uh, on Colin I mean, Wallace. It's, uh, I mean, it, it, it strikes me it's very interesting that Colin Wallace is, is somebody who I mean, you're a journalist who uh, I know uh, Colin Wallace very well. Yeah. Sure, uh, he is he is somebody who it seems journalists and and aficionados in this area have kind of split one way and another on. I mean, well, sure, absolutely. Well, why, sure. Why, I'll, tell you what, well, I'll tell you why. Because if you remember after, <laughs> after the Gibraltar when the SAS blew those IRA people away in Gibraltar. The unfortunate Carmen Proetta uh, was what, sorry? Mrs. Carmen Proetta, who yes, was, a was, un, was, was stupid of, enough or unfortunate enough to actually say, say she saw something she, should, she shouldn't have done. And about two days later, every tabloid newspaper and some of the serious ones mm. carried all this dis total dis lies about her. Right. Now, if you want to understand why Colin Wallace has been is, is, is disdoubted by people, just imagine how much effort they would, would go into discrediting him when he had evidence of the MI5 operating plots against Wilson. Wallace has, and still had, and still has physical evidence of this. Now, if you imagine Carmen Petter scaled up on a, you know, scaled up to 100, then you, you can explain to yourself why it is that there's an awful lot of stories about Colin Wallace. Plus, essentially, essentially, he served six years for manslaughter. I don't believe he did it. I don't believe he did the manslaughter, but it doesn't make any difference. Once you've been in prison for manslaughter, it's terribly easy to discredit you. And this was the Sussex police. And this was now this, this is a very interesting point that got lost because the, the man, George, the man, Mr. Terry, who was investigating some of your allegations, yes. which in bore roughly on Kinkora, mm -hmm. ended up heading one of the Kinkora inquiries. What a surprise. Gee whiz, what a coincidence. And guess what? He found nothing of any interest in it. Yeah. How astonishing. And how interesting when Ken Livingston asked questions right at the beginning of this year about it, the present uh, head of the Sussex police denied it. Then eventually, 
Six months later, oh yes, knew all Indeed. about it. And they all came trickling out. Yes. But just another, you see but what we've got now out. is a stack of cover-ups, you know, huge, and they're all interrelated. It will come out. And the story, the Wallace story is now so complicated. I mean, Wallace mm. is correspondent with the system. Yeah, it's, it's this thick. absolutely. Clearly, the story is extremely complicated. But I mean, but in a sense, it's, it's uh, I think, the point that the Merlin Reese was making earlier on. Whereas you may refer to, to Merlin as a, as a coincidence theorist, theorist, he, I suspect, would suggest that you're possibly, possibly, a conspiracy theorist. Now, I mean... It, I don't have any, I don't have a theory about any of this. I don't deal in theories. This term, cons con conspiracy theorist, is mis misabused. The world is manifestly cons written from conspiracies from top to bottom. I'm in the Labour Party. My ward of the Labour Party, and my tiny little fraction, is riven with conspiracies. Pol normal politics is conspiracy from morning till night. Mm. Every, con every political group is split into factions. They're all trying to kill each other or stab mm. each other or whatever. So Be let's... Careful. Be Political. Let's abandon this conspiracy theory crap, because the world, the political world, the real political world, the world that he knows, the world that you know, and the world that any of us know, it's conspiratorial from top to bottom. Sure, I but, think but, you're but stretching you're... conspiracy a little far. All right. But your, 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 your problem, surely, as a journalist working in this area, is that it is extremely difficult, isn't it? it? Is I mean, it's extremely difficult to actually pin down those documents that, uh, that you produced earlier on. You know, I mean, I, I make no judgment as to whether they are right or wrong. I'm, I'll give you another example. But it is extremely difficult to prove that they come from MI5. Indeed, indeed. You, well, you're in that, in, on those documents, we only have Colin Wallace's word. That's where they came from. As for Colin Wallace's general veracity, uh, it's all been tested. The media hasn't really noticed. Uh, they all gave up on this story last summer. But he sent Wallace, the, the one piece of physical evidence that Wallace actually kept with him was these handwritten notes. What he, he took down from, he says, from MI5 information. He was making, composing notes, writing notes to himself. He was going to write an essay, a big, big disinformation exercise. And the paper and the ink, it was all carted off to Dr. Julius Grant, the man that exposed the Hitler Diaries, the world's greatest expert on the date of paper and ink. And Julius Grant duly reported to the Observer to Channel 4 News, who both commissioned him that, yes, the paper and the ink was 1974. Now, these notes contain all the stand, all what are now recognisable as all the standard MI5 lines of 1974. Wilson's a communist, he's a homosexual, uh, Jeremy Thorpe's a homosexual, endless numbers of Labour MPs are communist agents, and it's all the stuff, all the garbage that was funneled through Oberon Wars column in private eye, for example. I mean, you can see this coming in all sides. Now, Wallace actually has these documents. They have been authenticated as far as it is possible to be authenticated by anybody. He's then volunteered to, took a lie detector test, went along to the man that GCHQ, was, cons was the government trying to impose on GCHQ, who gave him a lie detector test, asked him all the questions, clean as a whistle. None of this has been taken any notice of because of this long, rambling disinformation project which was run by the British state last summer against Wallace. And I was working for Channel 4 News at the time, researching his case, and I heard all the lines I expected because all the lines against Wallace were established just after his trial. They were all plonked into Daily Telegraph and the Daily Mail the day he was convicted, all the disinformation lines, and they all appeared last summer on cue. We were sitting there waiting for them. Today it'll be this one, and next week we'll get this one. And they all appeared. And if nobody, but you don't believe this happens, look at Carmen Proetta, because she is absolutely quintessential example. She was smeared from end to end, and it's all crap. Robert, can we narrow uh, this down to vendettas? Was it the Sussex Police versus Colin? I don't think that's true, no. Uh, as far as one, about Colin's conviction, as far as one can see, Colin, I think what happened, and you might be able to confirm this, how it would happen. Somebody Colin Wallace was involved with died. Yes. And I can imagine that they would go through all the, the, this guy's, the dead man's associates, and it would be Colin Wallace's name would be there, and there'd be a little flag saying, tell Special Branch, or of interest to Special Branch. Brilliant. And somebody in Special Branch said, oh, how nice. Mm. Somebody Colin Wallace is friendly with, was seen with on the night of the crime, has died. <laughs> Boom. But Robin, what about the blood on the car? The blood on the car was proved in court to have come from the people that assembled the car on the, on the, on the shift in British Leyland. All the medical incident reports. Were and that was in. a put up job by the Sussex police? I, I don't know. It's, I wouldn't like to say that. It's impossible. But to who, who took the evidence into court? The Sussex police, yes. as far as I know. Gentlemen, I, I think. Um, yeah, this I mean, is a side track. This, the, we, yeah. can't, we can't discuss Carlos's yeah. case. It, it's much too complicated. It seems, seems to me, in any case, that we, we, we have had an extraordinarily wide ranging discussion. We've actually gone on now for what's, uh, what's approaching three hours. It seems started. to me. <laughs> Could we seemed, get back to the broad, broader street? Well, I, 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 have a, I have a suggestion. I, I'm, I'm not suggesting for a moment that we need to actually completely wind up the conversation at, at, at this juncture. What I'm, what I'm saying is that it seems to me that one issue 
that has informed our discussions and has been crucial and central to our discussions throughout the evening is the, the allegations, not just made by Peter Wright, but by many others, about this uh, uh, alleged plot against Harold Wilson's government. Now, I have a question, and what I'd like to do is to perhaps draw our thoughts to a conclusion by, by going around the table and asking people to, to, to address this final question. To, to what extent is that now all past history? <laughs> to what extent should we do anything about that? And if we should do something, what is it that we should do? Robert, do you want to start? Mrs. Thatcher can never allow an inquiry into this. Why? Because her own position is at stake. Because some of her advisors today are the people who turned against Wilson. How do I know this? Do I not have tape recordings of those cabinet ministers at my own home? Do the Sussex police not know this? Why did the Sussex police come from 73 to the very day Anthony Blunt, in fact, week in 79, was exposed by my letters in private eye. Mrs. Thatcher has too much to lose and will never allow an inquiry into why Harold Wilson was booted. By, well, not booted, eventually left. Absolutely. My personal feeling is that uh, there is substance in this. Uh, alleged uh, plot against uh, uh, Harold Wilson, and uh, I agree with my friend here that um, Mrs. Thatcher is unlikely to uh, institute an inquiry. The only person who can really do it is Harold Wilson himself. Harold Wilson himself. But he withdrew from the own inquiry, the Pancourt thing. He withdrew yeah. himself. He didn't want it to go any further. Yeah, but I think he might change his mind. Mm -hmm. Merlin there was a Dirty Tricks campaign yeah. of a variety of sorts. I'm not very interested in the 68 mm. stuff. Uh, in 73, earlier probably, 71, 72, 73, <coughs> and 74. Um, it will not die because more and more people will reveal things about it. People like Ken Livingstone. Well, I don't know about Ken Livingston. I'm simply saying that, I mean, he's second-hand anyway. I'm talking about first-hand people <coughs> involved. And uh, eventually, uh, uh, more and more of it will come out, and you can't stop that. And it's, uh, I feel very strongly about it on two grounds. A, on the stuff that came out of Northern Ireland, which undoubtedly happened when my name was mentioned and others of friends, absolute rubbish. And that's got to be cleared. And also, because I don't believe it comes un under any heading of any uh, official secrets of any sort, or lifelong confidentiality. Nothing to do with a state, nothing to do with a country, nothing to do with patriotism. There was a dirty tricks element. It is the one thing that I have been concerned about over the years. I feel very strongly about it. And when you say, as you do quite correctly, that in terms of spying, which many people outside equate with it, as you point out, the spies aren't in my party. I'm not suggesting they're in the Conservative Party. And again, the point that you made, but that's the, that's the direction in which people's minds go. There was a dirty tricks campaign. It will be looked at. More and more information will come out. It's what motivates me. Gary? I feel that um, covert operations have been going on for years, and they will continue. The security service uh, will regularly engage in covert operations, orthodox ones and unorthodox ones. And I think anyone who is a threat to the present government can expect to be investigated. How no. far can they go? To murder? Yes. Serious allegations, aren't they? Yes. Yes. We've too many unexplained deaths in the country to accept them as accidents. It's just not feasible that so many people can die um, at the hands of um, burglars. Um, Dame Russell, the late Dame Russell, was a victim, of an ardent C&D campaigner. Uh, she woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning to be beaten. Her legs, or ankle, I believe, was broken. 
and she firmly believed she was the victim of a dirty tricks operation. The lady you mentioned, the lady in stains. There are lots of victims lying around if you go out there and do some research and you speak to them, you research the whole thing and there is a pattern. Men late at night or men posing as police officers or about the, the lady in Cheshire who was about to appear in a, a radio program half an hour before she was due to leave the house, the phone rings. I'm from the Ministry of Environment. If you go and appear in this radio program, we will release certain information, which he then described to the lady, and she became frightened, and she didn't appear in the radio program. I mean, this is not um, private enterprise for commercial reasons. This is some kind of covert operation on the behalf of a government operation. I know of a network of private spies in this country, private investigators, private security consultants, who regularly engage in covert operations. They have contacts with the government at the highest level. They share membership to a private organization with current serving intelligence officers in all branches of the armed forces. This is not a healthy environment. This is not good Marilyn security. Reese, you've now left Northern Ireland. You're still protected. Do you think, looking back on it all, that if you had it over again, you would have preferred not to have gone to Northern Ireland? Your answer is, no, I would go back to Northern Ireland tomorrow morning. Why? Because they're very nice people. They're very... Well, it's, there are views on that. I respect the people of Northern Ireland, and I'm interested in the matter. That's the real reason. Gary, can I just come back to the point you were, you were making there? This, this network of independent spies, as you mm. call them, uh, I mean... It really is a very, very serious allegation. It's been around for years. Uh, you can turn the clock back 20 or 30 years, which was slightly before my time, but, I mean, people like Crabbe, for instance, he was a, a freelance. Freelance spies have been around for generations, mm. for years. Mm. But, but now it's becoming organised because of the government, sorry, not the government, the security service, who need to have a covert operational system. And I, I, I accept that we do need covert operations. Why, why, do they, why do they need to use independent freelancers, though? Think about it. No. Deniable? Absolutely. Gary, Absolutely. Think of Something goes wrong. <gasps> nothing to do with oh, that, John. No, we know nothing think about this. of the war <laughs> and Stalin is absolute obsession about a man called Kenneth de Corsi, Corsi. and mm -hmm. his uh, little newsletter. You brought in about little newspapers. Well, de Corsi was a private intelligence operation. But I knew him during the war. Mm -hmm. I was sent to spy on him by Guy Birches. Well, this has appeared in the press. And de Corsi <laughs> was one of the outlets for the Wilson smears in the 70s. Yes. And do, do, you, do you think, Gary, that the, the actions, the activities of these independent freelancers, do you think that those actions are actually in any sense growing? Is it it's a cancer. It's growing. I spent four years researching these private spies, and I'm broad-minded. I've been around a few years, but I'm now concerned, and I'm frightened at what's going on. They will bug telephones. They will commit offences. They'll break. They'll enter. They will do anything. Let's face it, you go to Northern Ireland or you go to some operational area, Vietnam, or, well, let's use Northern Ireland, and you spend three or four tours over there, you become a hunter, a killer, you're engaged in covert operations, then suddenly you're a civilian. Where do you go to work? Where does a man from Northern Ireland who's worked undercover for all those years go to work? Does he sell newspapers? Does he sell computer parts? No, he goes to one of these many private companies operating in Britain who have contacts with the intelligence service. And he continues as a dog of law. A dog of law? Dogs dog of, of law. law. No, no, this one's a dog of law. Uh, well, mm -hmm. yes, but Good, dogs like of it. law. I like it. Dogs it's of law is, in fact, a book for publication next year. And having Good seen time. having seen mm -hmm. what's, what the synopsis is and having seen part of the manuscript, a lot of eyes are going to be opened about private spies mm -hmm. and how they engage in covert operations for the government. Mm -hmm. That's if it can be published, who knows? The authors m might not succeed. Mm -hmm. Might can run into the same kind of problems that John Can I, can I just ask something Probably about so, this privatisation? Yeah. Because we can actually trace, I think we can trace this privatisation phenomenon back to, I think it was 1969, when the Council on Foreign Relations, a very high-powered American East Coast elite think tank, set up a study of CIA. Now, this was just after there'd been the first revelations of CIA funding of student organisations. And they, their report concluded in general terms that the CIA should start using more and more thir uh, third parties using uh, the co a country's own intelligence services setting up private fronts. Now, I, have, I believe, but can't prove, that these conclusions were adopted in this country as well. 
and you can trace the growth of private deniable mm -hmm. operations to this basic decision taken by the CIA. But of course, um, under Reagan, of course, they've now privatized the war in, in Nicaragua, they're privatizing everything, and it's just deniability. It's just but, so that when the crap flies, they can stand back and say nothing to do with right. me. I wondered where we got it from. And what, where would you guess? An example, let me, let me give you an example. This is an original program of a seminar of a, a private organization in Britain of security and He's looking, he loves to say a name, don't you? It's a private organization of investigators and security consultants. Now, what would you say if I said that they'd attended an official uh, armed forces special investigation unit? They'd received instruction officially in surveillance techniques, interrogation. And some of these people were not positive, most of these private investigators or security men were not positively vetted, and yet they're receiving official uh, backing and official facilities in interrogation and general security um, duties. And they're just private investigators. Some with criminal convictions are in this organization. You can tell me about that so that I can look into it? We can have a talk about it, yeah. But this is the original. Um, I was there. I was there. Fortunately, I consider myself responsible. But I've been, as a civilian, as a private investigator, I've been um, in very sensitive bases. I've had firearms facilities made available to me. I've had instruction and lectures in surveillance, uh, VIP protection, as a private investigator. And yet, when we scream to the Home Office and other areas for legislation and control of private investigators and some kind of monitoring of their activities, we can't get it. That, that kind of training that you had, that, that came from a private source. It didn't come from a state source. Or no, it came it? from a state source. It came from a state source. I attended a series of um, official um, facilities and received lectures in surveillance, interrogation. Now, when you say attended, I mean, was that on a, I was a kind a of government, government base, an army base? An it RF was base done on the like? old boy network. Yeah. Yes, but, 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 but um, what, I, no, what, I, what I'm asking is physically, where did it take place? What, what was, was it? I'd rather not say. No, no, I'm, no what, I'm, what I'm asking, I'm not <laughs> even asking for the He'll tell you if he knows. Okay. <laughs> you see, you're no, in your no, one, just, just a moment, I think it's an important point to pursue. It, was it actually on something like an army base? Was it yes. something, yes. were they RAF people or army people or It was an official base, an official military or air force base. Mm -hmm. And the instructors, the lecturers, were official individuals. Right. And I have they were members of the British military forces. Yes, and right. I have the check number and details of a check <coughs> for five hundred pounds that went from the private institute to a serving military officer who was engaged in special investigation duties on the behalf of HMG. And he received into his personal bank account five hundred pounds for his services that weekend. I flew a helicopter, my own helicopter, and landed as a private person on the cricket pitch of an official base as a private investigator. Let, let me ask, let me ask you a, 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 an important question to Robin. I mean, in terms of how many files there are on different individuals, uh, in terms of how many files, for example, you think they, in inverted commas, may have on you, uh, do you have any ideas, any thoughts? Well, I mean, if they haven't got a file on me, they're not very good. Do you I'd think be they... insulted if they haven't got a file on me. The um, do, do, do you think they have all your other files? Uh, well, my, I mean, see, there's not, no point having my files. I'm, I just collect clip newspapers and read books. You see, this is another mystique, or another mistake. Some of the stuff that Gary's got secret, because he's dug it out the hard way. But eventually, all, everything, Gary, it'll all come out. And all you've got to do is read the papers, or read the books. Mm. And it's all there. It's not secret. I mean, you know, not, not, almost nothing I've ever published in my magazine, Lobster, has been a secret. It's just not been noticed, or it hasn't been put together with the other bit that makes sense of it. So it's a matter of often long linking bits Absolutely. and pieces together. We, there is a secret history in this, in this society, and it, the secret history really is the, is the history of the British state. And the problem that I've got with the, I'm in the Labour Party, with the Labour Party is the Labour Party has never been willing to admit that the state is the Labour Party's enemy. Never. And, it ne and the reason that nothing happened last year when all this stuff blew up about Peter Wright is the Labour Party would not go with it. They flunked it. And there was no support for the journalist researching it. Nothing was being done in Parliament. And eventually the story died because there was no political backing. Nothing was done in Parliament. Well, next to nothing. No, it's not true. No, no, come on, Merlin. I read all this. I read hands out. I know what was done. Yeah, Virtually true. nothing. Not true. The point is, is nothing was done. There was you did a little bit. Dale Campbell Sayers did a bit. Tam Dial did a bit. And now there's Ken doing a bit. But basically, as, a, as an institution, the Labour Party is not willing to acknowledge that the British state is its enemy, and the secret state most of all. Well, I don't believe the British state's my enemy. I believe well, there was a dirty tricks no, no, campaign. No. That's what I'm talking this about. This goes back to 1924. I can say something there that will slightly support you. Most of my targets, inverted commas, 
during my um, two years working for um, the Wombles of Curzon Street, um, most of them, if not all of them, uh, were, uh, well, they were not conservative types. Well, sure. of course. Coming yes, back to the general point of view. Yeah, I think we are. Yes, yeah. yes. Jock, jo 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 moving around the table, I mean, to, That's fine. to, to get back to, uh, to our yeah. central sort of just a kind of thought, I mean, you, so you so had some, idea, some concerns think. about GCHQ. Yeah. Um, others have talked about what perhaps we ought to do about uh, allegations concerning Harold Wilson. What do you think ought to be done about GCHQ now? Well, my whole theme always has been it must be thoroughly investigated, cleansed, and reformed. We need it, but we need it clean. Um, I've been listening to what's been going on here, and I'm aware of quite a number of these things that's been happening. The thing which has always uh, concerned me is that the security services, MI5, uh, Special Branch, and so on and so forth, have devoted so much time uh, investigating, chasing after fairly innocent organizations like CND. I'm not a supporter of CND, but I, I accept that they have their principles and they are entitled to them under our constitution. Well, we don't have a constitution. No, we under, don't. Our, under our system in this state, that they are entitled to pursue their beliefs. Um, but they have been pursued by um, the security services to a great extent to such an extent that the security services have not been able to do their own job, which is to prevent the subversion of the state by hostile agents. Uh, we've talked about the um, special branch, for example. Now, I went to special branch seven years before Jeffrey Prime confessed to his horrific crimes, and uh, with allegations that um, uh, GCHQ was uh, lethargic and ne negligent in security and were a danger to the state. And I was informed by the Assistant Commissioner of Special Branch that they had no jurisdiction to investigate GCHQ. Um, quite obviously, they were too busy chasing around after CND people, after uh, left-wing journalists and after members of the Labour Party and various other parties like this. And I come back again to the point I made earlier. Our friend here didn't deny my uh, allegations that um, VPK have penetrated our um, defense uh, works and so on and so forth. Uh, he had a different theory as to why they had done this, but he, he, he accepted my explanation. The theme there, which has been overlooked and overlooked by politicians and overlooked quite a great deal by the press and so on and so forth, is this business of top civil servants, people with a, a tremendous amount of information, highly secret information, uh, going into uh, defense contractors, people they had dealt with in their career in the civil service. Um, um, most of them, I would say, were probably quite innocent and so on and so forth, but it, it's not in keeping with the, uh, the, the, the principles of the civil service, the first rule of which says that a civil servant must not only be honest in fact, he must manifestly be seen to be honest. Well, if you have, for example, uh, GCHQ, which pours hundreds of millions of pounds into electronic firms like Raycon and Plessy and so on and so forth, and then you have uh, senior civil servants from GCHQ who take the decision to put these contracts to Raycon and Plessy on retirement, going into these firms on consultancy basis. Now, this that doesn't appear to me to be manifestly seen to be honest. And I feel that um, our, our intelligence services are penetrated. They, and one of the main reasons they are penetrated is because of the Soviet speciality in blackmail. They have used it. We've seen it being used in the past. And I'm quite sure it's being done in this sense. They know exactly what's happening. They know more than our government, our, our parliament knows. Uh, they're very well informed. The American intelligence know more about their penetration than, uh, than MI5 or MI6 know. And my, nothing, but... nothing, no MP. Now, it, it was made quite public. There were 740 approvals from the uh, Foreign Office for people of uh, uh, the MOD to go into these uh, organizations. Yes. 
at a time when, when we have massive unemployment in the country, obviously people who are specialised in this field, unemployed, and you have retired civil servants who have dealt with these firms during their career going in there. Uh, but, re but realistically, practically, given the climate that, that we find ourselves in, given the fact that, as you say, you have been unable to generate the level of interest amongst politicians that you feel you should be able to generate, practically, what can or should be done about GCHQ? And if the answer to that question is that realistically you feel this, this government is not going to do much, where does that leave us with GCHQ? Well, that leaves us with GCHQ as a, the most important intelligence organisation, much more important than MI6. Indeed. Heavily penetrated, because it's not, that's not just my word. This has been seen. Last year, documents were turning up in Moscow from GCHQ. I said it back in 1983 that Jeffrey Prime was not the only spy in GCHQ, that there were other spies more important than Jeffrey Prime there. Uh, American intelligence came out later and they said it was their belief that there was at least five other spies, Soviet spies in GCHQ, two at a senior level and three at a more junior level. And are they still serving? They will still be serving in, uh, in GCHQ, but because the government refuses to uh, intervene in this situation, intelligence is pouring out of GCHQ to possible hostile powers. Alistair Mackey, let me perhaps finally ask you. Um, it seems to me that uh, you are a man who has a series of views now which don't perhaps accord with the views that one might have expected you to have held some years back. Um, do you still feel that you have um, a some sort of lifelong oath of allegiance, some lifelong oath of secrecy about what you learned when you were in the forces? And, and what, if anything, would persuade you to break that oath? Absolutely nothing would persuade me to break that oath, not so much because I'd be chucked in jug, but because I did give the oath. But could I just try and bring this back to centrality? Well, you can do, but answer my question first of all, because... Well, the answer to your question is nothing would no, persuade me, but nothing. No moral issue? I am not prepared under any circumstances whatever, having sworn an oath of allegiance to depart from that oath. Conversely, I will do absolutely everything I can to advance my views, to advocate what I believe in, to the limit of that. That is why, admittedly in jest, but behind that quite seriously, mm. I would not dream of betraying any secrets in this or any other assembly. And there's a point you wanted to make? I just wanted to make a more general point Please. on my going around the table. I, I'm, if I may say so, fascinated by the horrors to which we've been exposed, and it seems to me that the background is just as sombre as the horrors. We're in a circumstance today in which authoritarianism is all. The BBC has been filleted of almost everybody who's got the guts to stand up to the government. We've got an arid, awful central core curriculum in the schools to stop little minds formulating nasty anti-government thoughts. The universities have been bled of most of their money and academics deprived of their right, their permanent entrenched right to be independent. We have got a press with one or two shiny exceptions which is a disgusting, unpleasant, revolting, toady, pro-Tory outfit. Not, not to mention the tabloids. I wouldn't like to. I wish to. I don't have to wish to, to wash my mouth out afterwards. Above all, this external authoritarianism, the terror, which has been bred by the circumstance which is slowly developing, has moved us as a nation at a time when everybody else is talking about peace and reducing nuclear we weapons. What are we doing? We are bloody well increasing them. And we're bundling that through the democratic process under cloaks of secrecy. That's what I see as the background, the setting, in which this nasty little document and all the other ghastly things which have been an education to me, I confess, uh, should be regarded. Alistair Mackey, you've drawn us to uh, a fascinating a, a conclusion. Well, well, I thought, I thought you, did you not? Oh, oh well, do, do jump Ars, in, Ars, do Ars, jump Ars, in. Just do jump to in. Say, are you going to get the final word, but then you got in front of me. <laughs> to go back to your question, will there be an inquiry? No. 
quite simply because if you look at the Watergate model, what sunk Nixon in the end wasn't this bit of hanky-panky bureaucratizing people. It was the fact that he went for, he'd commit himself to the cover-up. Same thing's happened in this country. Mrs. Thatcher is now committed to the cover-up. You want a smoking gun? Here is a smoking gun. Mrs. Thatcher's letter to Ken Livingston, which says, Mr. Wallace's allegations have been fully and carefully investigated. That is not true. Therefore, there can be no inquiry. This is not the case. Now, she didn't write this letter. She just signed it, or indeed a machine may have signed it for her. Nonetheless, she carries the can. That is a lie. Nobody Wallace worked with, from the top head of Army PR down to the junior clerks, has ever been talked to. Paul Foote has interviewed all of them on tape. There has been no inquiry. It's complete bullshit. The cover-up is now in place. There will be no inquiry. I guarantee it. There will be no inquiry until she goes. Good uh, gentlemen, the general point. You, yeah. um, there will be no inquiry. Yeah, right. Uh, it, it's one thing, it seems, that we're... Uh, we're all in agreement on. Gentlemen, we've, we've ranged far and wide in this conversation. I'm grateful to all of you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you indeed for uh, staying with us and uh, watching. Uh, next week, um, after dark, we'll be back on Saturday evening. Look forward to uh, seeing you then. Until then, good night. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. What uh, we're going to do is ask you to stick with us. Just Uh, don't ever ask what job you're on. It's hush hush. Don't ever ask where the empire's gone. It's hush hush. If you invent a code that's new, nobody must be able to decide for the code, not even you. It's hush hush. Your safes must be as safe as rocks and baffle all investigations. Double cross your double locks and keep on changing your combinations. Always travel in darkened specs. Use a cross to sign your checks. Never reveal your age or sex. It's hush hush, 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 hush.